So, Rickster, how was your day today? All good? Yeah. Nothing, um, you know, nothing exciting, nothing uh, just normal. Did an did, um, hour and a half course this morning. Um, it was like part two of um, the full day class for the folks out in Colorado. Oh, nice. It went well. Yeah. Excellent. Hey, Mr. Trot is here. Mr. Trotter Trotter. is here. <laughs> How do you not Mr. recognize Mr. Trotter? <laughs> Mr. Trotter the <Trotter> third. <laughs> Good evening, Wheels. Wheels is with us, all right, in the house. Woo! All right, let's get this show on the road because this house is rocking. So don't you come knocking. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to what? What episode is this? This is this is like getting like Nine. Star Wars. How many episodes do we have? <laughs> this episode. Turn me on, man. Turn me on, Dead Man. Number nine. Number nine. Very good. Number nine. Yeah, this is episode number nine um, of Takeo After Dark. Uh, welcome everybody, and uh, and uh, and a shout out to Mechan the guys at Mechanical Hub, Tim Ward and John Messenbrink. Why don't you say hello to everybody and and thank you guys for putting this thing on. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks hello, for joining, everybody. <laughs> You know, week nine, man. This is uh, this is great. Uh, yeah, we'll... this is like number nine dream almost too. If you want to get you know, Mr. Mayo, see if you remember that one. That's right. So, you know, as long as you guys want to keep doing this and spreading the knowledge and the fun, we're all for it. So. Oh. Well, we're spreading something. I'm not entirely sure what it is, but we <laughs> we are the best spreaders out there. I'll tell you what, John. Uh, thank you. A... Really, thank you guys for the opportunity for for allowing us to do this and and. Uh, and bringing this audience together again uh for you first timers and maybe a first timer out there uh, there's very few rules here it's after dark man you know so we're gonna we've got a we got about an hour's worth of presentation and then after that all bets are off uh you can stay on as long as you want after that uh we've been on as as long as an extra hour and a half uh going into like 9 30 at night uh just answering your questions and shooting the breeze about hydronics so any questions you guys have is fair game and we're, we're happy to answer them for you and, and, and go do a little back and forth. And that way we can all learn from each other and we uh, have and have a good time while we're doing it, too. So that's uh, that's kind of that's kind of that's kind of the, the takeo after dark way. All right. And for those of you who've been with us, you'll note that the uh, the, the theme, of course, is. The law offices of Vincent L. Gambini representing Utes since 1992. So I'm guessing you understand. This is my cousin Vinny. Is the uh, is the theme for this weekend or this week or whatever? All right, it's coronavirus time. I don't know what day it is anymore. Week, weekend, whatever it is. We're all over the place. So. It's all the same. It's all the it's same. It's all the same. It's all the same. So let's get this show started. Um, well, before we get there, John, just uh, yes, just oh, right. I mean, we are at week nine. So uh, if you haven't seen all of the other eight episodes that we've had, if you wanted to go back and review them at any time or you missed them, uh, they are uploaded onto uh, Mechanical Hub's YouTube page as well as uh, Taco's YouTube page. So uh, all those old episodes have been recorded and you can and the entirety of it was there, too. So. Uh, you can go back except, and watch except, it for, except for part eight, John. I haven't gotten you part eight yet, have I? I'm having some some downloading issues. So we'll see if I can get that figured out this week. So we'll, we'll get that done. Oh, I think oh. we're to, uh, part seven on the uh, YouTube channel. So we'll get it this week sometime. So. All righty, very good. We'll get we'll get that to you as soon as we can. And, and cell phone going off like that, John, that's a $20 fine. I just want you to know that. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> All righty, so uh, take a after to dark part nine. Let's get the show on the road. Tonight, we're gonna be talking about mixing valves multi-temp multi-load systems on boilers even with modcon boilers and how might we maximize those and we're going to spend the last portion of the program on indirect water heaters and understanding what all those numbers mean and and how to how to maximize the output of an indirect water heater even if you're, you're using a boiler sized for the heating load instead of the indoor instead of the domestic hot water load can we make that work we'll we'll examine some possibilities here and at least you'll know what you're getting and uh, and what we're working with so without any further ado, let's uh, kind of give a quick review of last week. Um, myself and the two Utes here, uh, we talked about uh, a whole bunch of different things. We talked about uh, piping for ModCon boilers, all right? We went through um, uh, 
uh, and we went through the primary, secondary, or closely spaced T's piping arrangements. We talked about uh, hydraulic separators. We talked about uh, buffer tanks and all the different ways we have of, si of piping up those boilers and how truly it easy it is to pipe one of these things up because they send you a book, all right? You just do what it says in the book. ModCon boilers do not reward you for being creative, all right? You follow the directions and you'll be fine. Uh, we talked about uh, how to figure out what water temperature you have to have your boiler make in order to get the desired water temperature in that delivery loop. Uh, we did a simple three-way mixing math formula uh, to kind of show you what that was and how to figure out, well, I need 150 degree water here. What water temperature does the boiler have to make? It turned out to be like 161 or something like that. Uh, we talked, Rick, what, Rick did an excellent program on sizing the boiler circulator and how very easy it is to oversize that circulator and what can happen when that circulator is oversized. And uh, you wanna be careful. It's Again, it's some simple math, understanding the, the, the relationship between delta T and, uh, you know, and, and BTUs. It's GPM equals BTUs divided by delta T times the, the factor that you're using. And then take into account the head loss of the heat exchanger at the flow rate you need and then you'll be able to accurately size your circulator. And uh, you know, wide delta T's in that, in that application are always best. Yeah. And then we talked about the benefits of buffer tanks and how to size a buffer tank and uh, why you might wanna use one, specifically if you have a lot of small zones and those zones are smaller than the lowest firing rate of the boiler. Buffer tanks are very useful to prevent short cycling in that, in that uh, situation. So that was pretty much a, it's a, a you know, five cent recap of last week. This week, we're going to get into uh, what you need to know all about mixing valves, different types of mixing valves, tempering valves, fixed temperature, you know, fixed temperature, non-electric thermostatic valves, as well as motorized mixing valves like the Taco I-valve, which has uh, some pretty cool properties to it and capabilities. And we'll show you all about that. Uh, we're going to talk about multi-temp, multi-loads, multiple temperature, multiple load systems, where maybe I, I on a ModCon boiler, I might have three different loads that require three different water temperatures. Well, I can reset the boiler for that highest water temperature, but what about those other two? Is resetting off the reset a good idea? Dave will talk about that. And then again, we're going to give you the indirect load down at the very end. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Judge Chamberlain Halla and uh, see if uh, he can figure out what uh, figure out uh, how to convince these two youths that uh, they should uh, plead uh, not guilty uh, kind of thing there. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to the judge. Your Honor, take it away. Oh, you were serious about that? <laughs> yes, I was serious <laughs> about that. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see here. Let me get back up and running here. I don't know what you guys are seeing at the moment. I've probably got the wrong screen up, don't I? Yeah. Good that good you're, you're prepared, Dave. That a boy. <laughs> I got it open on this screen, but don't forget, I got I got multiples. I'm sorry. You got multiples, yes. So right now, I just see the three of us. There you go. There you go. There you go. That a boy. Okay. I guess I got to get rid of the questions here. I'm not going to pay attention to those. I'll take. I'll watch I'll, the questions for you. I'll be doing the work. Let's get rid of that, and I'll get rid of that, and we'll rock and roll. All right, so let's take a look at multi-temp systems, or mostly looking at the mixing valve and looking at the I-valve here um, to a degree. I mean, we talk about it uh, uh, quite often. Uh, damn it. Don't move it. Wrong button. Whoops. Whoops. Yeah, sorry. Whoops. Whoops. All right. Yeah, why? Yeah, so um, looking at using the, the I-valve here uh, for some reason, or modulating the water temperature, uh, but not just the boiler water temperature. We wanna look at uh, the load temperature going out to the system itself. So we, we might be looking at a boiler system that's already going to have uh, a high temperature connected to it, maybe some low temperature, but also not just rating it floor also, we can actually lower the temperature of our other systems that we have connected to it. So, you know, the outdoor reset, it is good, but we're looking at boiler reset here. And when we can get individuals and start looking at load reset, then we're going to start looking at system reset. So, and we're going to make the wiring simple. We want to make it an easy system. We're not going to make it that complicated here. Um, 
So now we're looking at possibly resetting individual zones as we're seeing more and more zones show up in a house. You know, we, we look at the boiler controller um, and that is looking at the outdoor temperature and modulation of water temperature there. We're not looking at doing anything that exquisite with the control in there. We might change the water temperature going out to the system itself, but it doesn't know the zones. It knows what the boiler sees and that's it. And it's going to assume it's a single zone out there. And, and also when we start looking at some of the load reset controls and components, we're also gonna be able to get some of that boiler protection if needed, if we're not looking at our mod con that has an outdoor sensor on there where we might be looking at cast iron. So, so to really think about load reset or even outdoor reset for that matter too, is a couple of things we're paying attention to as, as the outside temperature drops, obviously the heat loss is going to change. And as that heat loss is changing, you know, the, the heat loss is going to increase as the outdoor temperature is starting to decrease. And when we start putting these components in here, some of the best analogies that I like to give to um, outdoor reset, especially when talking to about it with a customer, is do not use ever the terminology that we are familiar with because they have no idea. You're going to get homeowners that are going to look at you with the hinge neck syndrome. They just start shaking their head and agreeing with you and they have no idea. And what they're really thinking about at that time when they're talking to you is, all right, when's this guy gonna stop talking? And you know, I'm just gonna keep on agreeing with him so he actually moves on to something that I understand. So when we start talking about uh, individual reset or outdoor reset, think cruise control that you have in a car, but explain it that way when we start explaining cruise control we start explaining think about going across flat land setting it at uh, uh, uh 70 miles an hour 60 miles an hour but notice the injectors notice the rpm of the car all right they're steady it's flat land you're going 60 miles an hour you're done you start going up a hill what happens to your speed stays the same so the speed's not changing but the rpms are going up and and uh, you're, you're, you're going to hear the injector starting to go in the car itself. And same thing when you start going down a hill. Everything starts to back off. When you're going down the hill, hey, it's getting warmer outside. When you're going up the hill, it's getting colder outside. So now that's what we're looking at here. And now what we're going to do with load reset is do that on individual zones. Because then it's also paying attention to what that thermostat setting is. So it's not just you know, looking at the whole house as a whole or looking at the whole boiler, but now we start looking at individual zones at the same time. <clears throat> so yes, reset baseboard. There are way too many projects that I hear out there um, that has a nice, beautiful ModCon boiler hanging on the wall and the outdoor sensors in the box next to the boiler. Never hooked up. It's just sitting there, right? Rick, you've probably run into a lot of jobs yourself, right? Sure. You know, and I and I hear out there a lot. It's I'm hearing about 60% that don't have the outdoor sensor hooked up because it's hooked up to a high temperature system. Um, so it's just understanding how the system works and understanding what we're going to get out of that. So yes, we can definitely do less than 180 degrees for baseboard. So for example, let's take a look at these charts here from slant fin. So we take a look at the slant fin element. And what you're looking at here is individual temperatures in the columns. And then we have our different water flows. Now, John already went over these. All right. Well, we were doing some calculations earlier uh, in the presentation of a couple of weeks. I don't even know. Week three, week four, maybe. Something like that. Right. Didn't we Heat pull these up sometime? Yep. We did. Yeah. Yep. So that was well, what two. I want session two, it was. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so let's take a look at what we've got going on here. So with these different columns, when you look at the 180, a lot of people immediately pull the 180 column. All right. That's actually average water temperature. That's typically 190 boiler water temperature with a 20 degree delta going back to 170. So we want to use the 170 columns. So, but we can get BTUs as we get cooler. Now, this area here, why is it grayed out? Why is it we have shading on here and asterisk? Hey, pay attention to this because one, 
we might want to use a ModCon boiler in here. And two, what if we're doing a retrofit or putting a new boiler into a house that has existing baseboard in there? Doesn't need to run at 180 degrees. Let's lower that water temperature. But what temperature do you run it at? So let's take a look at doing the math here. So our example is saying, yeah, we did a heat loss on the structure. Yes, you're going to need to do a heat loss if you really want to gain some efficiency out of the system itself. So let's say we're around 25,000 BTUs is the heat loss of this structure. But 70 feet got installed. And you know that's not hard. You know, you only needed 50 based upon the 25,000 BTUs, but 70 is installed. And when you think about it, you know, I know a lot of parts of the area, you know, a lot of the parts of the country, people walk into the room, they see an outside wall with a window, fill it. That's how much baseboard goes in. There's no load done. So, or if there was a load done and you had a 10 foot wall and the heat loss calls for six and a half feet, what ends up in there? You're going to drop whole 10 feet in there. Right, we don't want it to end in the middle, so we're going to be over radiated. So let's do the, the the math in reverse here. So let's use a lower water temperature to take advantage of the amount of element that we have installed in the house. So we know we can deliver over thirty five thousand BTUs running that one hundred and eighty degree water. So if we come back and let's just do some quick reverse math. What, how many, what temperature do I need? So you just, you can just grab a column and just test it out. So by grabbing, say, um, the 150 degree column at 380 BTUs per linear foot, multiply that by 70, that gets us 26,600, which is over the 25,000. So that means, all right, that's our maximum water temperature that we would need to run out to the house. We don't have to go any hotter than that because we have so much extra element installed in the house. So let's use a lower water temperature and let's call this for the first floor of the house and we'll lower the water temperature. Not necessarily, you know, we could do that right off the boiler reset control. Great. Maybe another zone is going to be just as over radiated, maybe even percentage wise larger than this. So we can drop it down even further. And especially if you're looking at that ModCon boiler. So now you've got, you know, you've got your loads, multiple loads being reset. You've got the boiler being reset. And now I look at the two together as being a system reset. And now you're singing and dancing and letting everything do what it's supposed to be doing. Modulate the world. All right. That's the way I look at it and trying to do a lot of our radiant, our, our heating system. And think about tying this into radiant floor too. You know, so now we're looking at even cooler water temperatures coming back into that boiler. So how are we knowing what's going on and how do we control the water temperature? So it's it's based upon an outdoor reset curve. And there's there's some information that needs to be put into it to and, and need to know about the system itself to know where you need to go. So we're looking for outdoor design temperature. Use the ASHRAE numbers. Use what's in your neighborhood not what you kind of think it's going to be, all right, or what you've ever think you've seen before. So use those ASHRAE numbers. And, you know, for, for where I am on Long Island, ASHRAE design calls for 14 degrees above zero. Does it get colder than 14 on Long Island? Yes, it does, all right? And, but that column, you know, when, when, when ASHRAE has, has recorded the data, they have said, on Long Island, it's 14 degrees above zero for 97 and a half percent of the time. What's colder than 14 degrees to an engineer? You know this ooh, one, ooh. John. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> that would be that would be 13 degrees, Dave. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it would be 13.99. 9999. Nine, nine, nine. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so to an engineer, that's monstrous, right? So. Trust the numbers, trust the math that's being done. So use that outside design temperature because when it gets to 14 degrees on Long Island, I can send 160 degrees. But what you could do on the systems itself, if it does get colder, you do have that little bit of extra to keep going back. For example, it will if you go back to a, a, a maximum design water temperature, it can go as it gets colder. So use that number. So that's where you get the proper curve that you're looking at. 
So you want to know your mix design water temperature, not the mix maximum. All right, mix design for that design day. What temperature do you want to send out there? Uh, you want to know your warm weather shutdown. So it's going to shut down at a certain temperature outside. So even so, it's not going to do any modulation, and it needs to know that start point um, and for the temperature too that you're putting into the system. So your reset ratio is going to be a formula that you need to do some quick math on, and it's not hard. Here's your formula for looking at doing your reset ratio. We look at the mixed design temperature, minus 72, all right, because that's our starting point, all right? Our starting point uh, for our controllers is looking at 72. And then we take the 72 minus the design outdoor temperature. We divide that into mixed design minus 72, all right? So let's, let's go through an example for that. So our mixed design, like we said, is gonna be 160 degrees. Our outside design for our today's example is gonna be zero. I'm not using the Long Island one. So we do the math, 160 minus 72, divide that by 72 minus zero, we get 88 over 72 and your reset ratio is 1.2. So if you look at the curve that I was just showing you before, um, Here's a whole bunch of those different curves. As you start to adjust it and dial it into your style system itself, here's also the other way to do it. So you go ahead and you take a look at your, uh, your mixed water temperature, your outdoor design, get to that curve, and we have a reset ratio curve of 1.2. So that's your second way that you could take a look at. Use the instructions, use the book that comes along with the controller so you know how to set it up. So that's what we're looking at as a reset ratio of 1.2. What does 1.2 mean? All right, what that means is for every temperature increase, all right, of 1.2 degrees for every one degree drop in outdoor temperature. So it's that ratio related to outside air temperature to what water temperature needs to be sent down. So it's going to modulate that back and forth based upon the temperature changing outside. All right. Does that make sense? Are there any questions so far, John? I haven't no, been doing, paying attention. Doing, to we're doing pretty good here, as far as the yep. questions. Sorry, as far as the questions are concerned. Okay. Um, yep. Uh, well, there was one question regarding that outdoor sensor, and it, it had to do with: uh, uh, do, Would you use an outdoor sensor? Would you connect the outdoor sensor on a ModCon boiler when using a buffer tank? And uh, the short answer is yeah. Uh, mm -hmm, I guess the, mm -hmm. the long answer is why wouldn't you? Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't see any reason why not to use the outdoor temperature sensor. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess you can, then it's just as good as a cast iron boiler. It's just going to stay off longer. If you rank that buffer tank up to 180 degrees and just leave it there, you're just going to draw off of that more, you know, but no reason to. Right. Right. Here's an interesting question. Yeah. And, and let's see if this is the right time to answer it or if we want to table it. This is from Kevin McAvoy. How do we explain reset to how do we explain reset better to customer who complains they don't feel the heat? Oh boy, this goes back. I remember getting this question in 1988. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, this is an old one. I mean, I said I, I could feel that thing. Come on, uh, it, it's kind of like you know, it's not that. Do, do you feel the heat? Do you feel comfortable? Um, best one. The best one I ever heard was this. Um, was uh, you know when you uh, over the course of the winter, do you always wear your warmest clothes all the time, your warmest jacket every day of the winter? Well, no, you don't. You have a jacket, you know, your 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 super thermal jacket for when it's zero degrees outside. When it's 25 degrees outside, you might have a different jacket uh, or you don't zip it up or something like that, or you don't have the long johns on underneath. And then when it's maybe 40 degrees, you're wearing a much lighter jacket. So, you know, you have different clothes for different outdoor conditions. It's the same thing with your heating system. You know, you could you could either wear that 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 heavy thermal, you know, well below zero jacket when it's, you know, 45 degrees outside, just keep taking it off when you feel too hot and then put it back on and then take it off and put it back on, or you could wear a jacket that's appropriate for the for the for the for the for the weather. That always worked for me, and I don't. I don't know if you guys have any other other uh, um, uh, methods. Uh, I that's, think that's always worked for me. I think it's just explaining to homeowners what's going on, because mm -hmm. they have been 
drilled into their head that the only way to save fuel is to do setback. Right. And that's why I said, if you're going to talk to them what we're doing in reset, talk to them in their words, not ours, mm -hmm. because they don't understand our words. They understand cruise control in a car. Yeah. And I'll explain it yeah. to them in those terms. Um, stop doing, they can still do setback. Just don't do so deep a setback. So they've been told, oh, eight, 10, 12 degree setback. No, do a couple. Yeah, yeah three do to three, five. Three to four degrees. Yeah. yeah. Three to five for no less than six to eight hours. Yeah. Right. So Ant Anthony's got a good point. Um, he's got a question. Well, not a question. He's just making a point here that says you better have this conversation when you when you sell the product, not when they call you and say, why isn't it working? You know, right. you're playing, play catch up and doing the Michael Jackson backup steps and all that <laughs> stuff. So the moonwalk. Uh, good point, Anthony. Uh, yeah, oh, you got to have that conversation right up front that your panel radiators or your radiators, your radiators are not going to feel the same because now we're just like Dave said, we're using cruise control. We're just going to give you just the temperature you need to keep your house nice and comfortable. And more importantly, you are comfortable. Uh, so right. it won't feel as hot. Right. And I think that's the biggest thing is to have the conversation with our homeowners. I think that's the biggest thing that gets forgotten all the time is that we don't have that conversation with them to tell them what it's supposed to feel like. And hey, I'm just as guilty. I did it. So my mother-in-law's house, my in-law's house, took out the old cast iron boiler that was there. <laughs> we put in the ModCon boiler. I put it on. It was a single zone house, so I didn't change anything there. Um, but I did do modulating boiler, outdoor reset, and the Delta T circulator for a fin tube baseboard throughout the entire house. And I remember this, uh, I, I, I'm on the road, I'm down in Baltimore for a couple of days. And I remember calling over to my in-laws house because I knew my wife was going to be here and my mother-in-law answers the phone. And of course I'm cordial and I'm talking to her. And I just happened to say, oh, by the way, how's the heat? Because then it was the first cold snap that we happen to have back on Long Island. And she says, oh yeah, I've been meaning to call you. I don't think it's working. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, you know, I won't be home for like three days and it's not working. Who am I going to call? I got to call my buddy, Mike. I got somebody over the house, take a look at it. And I turn around and say, wait a minute, mom. Uh, so what's the, the thermostat setting? What's it, what's the temperature in the room right now? And she says, oh, well, it's 68 degrees. And I said, okay, well, what do you have the thermostat set for? And she said, 68. If you do the math. It's working. That's working. <laughs> so what she didn't, you know, um, thinking about it was she didn't hear it anymore. It didn't mm -hmm. hear that rush of water going through the baseboard pinging and ticking and things like that and all making that noise. So I did not have the conversation with my in-laws. All I told them was I'm putting in a new boiler. Let's make it better. And that was it. So understanding the reset curve too. So is, is, is some of those things to change. Now, uh, if you need to change the reset ratio, then you might have to change the water temperature. So still reset it, but now maybe change the temperature to getting to a um, your design temperature earlier, meaning not wait for zero degrees, maybe come in at 10 degrees or 20 degrees and hit your design. So you flatten out the curve so you're not getting as much. So it may depend upon the house itself and the systems that is going on there. Jerry McPeak actually has a really good point. The difference between an explanation and an excuse is when you tell it. <laughs> I would say any married guy knows that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jeff Kelly's got one um, in regards to he's he, the stratification within a buffer tank. He's talking about, you know, sending too hot a water out. Uh, Jeff, a lot of the manufacturers will allow you two different sensor locations. Uh, we talked about uh, last week uh, putting it right in the middle of the tank so you get an average tank temperature. Uh, you're right. If you're pulling off something uh, off the top of the tank, you potentially are going to be hotter than that because hotter water is going to go to the top. Uh, what you can do, and other people have done this, is take that sensor and put it on the pipe coming out of the buffer tanker, uh, bu buffer tank out to the system, and that will uh, take a better look at what that um, temperature actually is rather than an average of what the tank temperature is. So anyway. 
Very good. good. Very good. Dave, continue. All righty. Thank you, sir. All right. So let's take a look at it hooked up to a cast iron boiler. So if we are looking at a single zone like this, um, or maybe even multiple zones, we may be able to branch off of this and go to several circulators coming off of here. Uh, we are going to want to consider doing primary secondary piping around that boiler itself. So this way we are not sending back this colder water coming back from the, uh, from the heating zone. So we want to blend that back in like we did in previous uh, last week's session. So we showed you what that water temperature would be with the closely spaced T's. So you can calculate that out properly. Um, so, but when doing that now we're, you know, we can reset that delivery going out to the system itself. Boiler's still going to run on that high limit. Maybe this does not have an outdoor reset. We didn't hook up a, a PC 700 or something like that. It's just going to run on that um, uh, set point temperature. So, and what's also nice with some of these controllers is that they will have sensors in several areas. We'll do an outside sensor. We'll do a supply water temperature sensor, and it'll also do a boiler return sensor. And when you put that boiler return sensor in, it says, all right, we're not going to close anymore. We're not going to go colder, so I'm not dropping the return temperature. We're just going to stop where we're at right now um, and hopefully let the boiler recover if it was such a large zone like this right now. So now we get a, a more efficient, and, and when's the boiler most efficient? When it's off. When it's off, right? So we that. fire this thing. Yeah, we fire this up to 180 degrees, and we only need 135 going out to our system itself. So we're just going to sip those BTUs out of here. The BTUs are going to slowly come out. So if the boiler is not on outdoor reset and it bangs up to 180, you know, it's kind of like having that big old buffer tank. Let's just draw off the buffer tank before we have to fire the boiler again until it gets to that design call again. And so take advantage of that mass that we have in the cast iron boiler. So, <clears throat> and of course, if you were to do boiler reset on here, uh, if you did put an outdoor sensor running the boiler and modulating the water temperature, one of the things I would pay attention to definitely was look at the reset curve, the water temperature of the boiler to be higher than your mix temperature. A couple degrees, not too much. You need to be a couple of degrees apart. So this way, you know, the beauty of this valve is that it can go straight full open. And it could take technically straight boiler water, whatever temperature came out of here, going out to our system if need be. I usually like to just give it a couple of degrees above so you know what you got there. Got a little bit extra. We'll start looking at our mod con boilers in modulating our mixing temperatures. And if we look at multiple temps, like this example is where we've got a high temperature here, and then we have a lower temperature, maybe to radiant floors. I mean, this is starting to look like my house. And this is uh, what I have is not necessarily radiant floor here. Uh, this is a high temperature radiant floor and two or lower temperatures of radiant floor. So I have a 150 degree zone. I have 130 and I have a 100 degree zone. So that's how I have mine piped out. I don't have these separate circulators except for my indirect coming off. Um, but now we're looking at those multiple temperatures tied into a ModCon boiler, reset off the reset, as, as, uh, as we were saying before. So, and get as cool a water as possible coming back to this boiler. Give it all the chances it can to condense, to let it do what it's supposed to do. So now what you do with the same valve is that we don't hook up the outdoor, the, the I'm sorry, the uh, return, the boiler return sensor, and the valve just says, all right, I'm not going to worry about that. We can get, we can keep on going down colder and colder out of that. <clears throat> so I, I got this curve uh, from my buddy, Anthony. And if, if you've ever hung out with Anthony Rykow in some uh, boiler combustion classes, he does a great job at this. All right, and I'm not even going to do any justice here whatsoever, uh, where he starts talking about where we're going to get this boiler condensing. But you take a look at this, and this is what we're looking at here. We're looking at inlet water temperature into the boiler itself at the bottom of the screen here, and our boiler efficiency. And if we're using a lot of these ModCon boilers, and we're not running a cold temperature or getting as cool as a water temperature as we can, then it's just not going to be condensing. All right, so and looking at the at this chart here is showing me 130 degrees. 
as my return water temperature, that's when we start condensing. If you look at this right here, if we had 180 going out and 160 coming back at 160 degrees, we're at just over 86%. That's not bad compared to the cast iron boiler that you could have put in, but we charged a heck of a lot more for this boiler to go on the wall. So get these things as cold as possible coming back, and that's when we start seeing what the brochure says, the warm and fuzzy. You read those brochures, right? That brochure says on the front side, the homeowner loved it because it said 97%. Well, when does it get to 97% efficiency? If you look at this chart here, if you send back about 50 degree fluid, 50 degrees. So if we have any radiant floor systems that are sending back 50 degrees, then it's going to be a little too cold. So, <clears throat> and yes, there's a whole bunch of other factors like Anthony's saying there. Yes, I see that. Don't forget the CO2 factor and, and things like that. So yes, uh, as Rich says, two huge words, up to 97%. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. <clears throat> All right. So, how are we doing that? I know I briefly talked about the I valves real fast, uh, but obviously, we could consider the manual mixing valve that we came out with in 1927, right? We could do that, but obviously, this is not going to do a lot for us. This is just a blending of temperatures. There is no real control over it. You open and close the valve and you hope you get the temperature going out. So let's not, you know, we'll maybe use that for domestic systems, but we're not going to use that for any, any uh, hydronic systems here. But we can go thermostatic. And we do see that obviously in a lot of radiant floor systems out there. So we do see a thermostatic systems, but it's going to be a fixed temperature. And the temperature is not going to change. It's just going to be a fixed output temperature. And that temperature is going to stay fixed even if the boiler's modulating. So if the boiler's modulating, you're not going to see a change going out to your heating system with a thermostatic. We use them a lot because they're simple and they're easy. So we look at the I-valve. Now we modulate the water temperature. And we have two versions of the I-valve. We have an outdoor reset model, and we do have a set point model, which gives you a fixed temperature. Um, and there's, there'll be some applications where you may need it to be set uh, fixed. Um, but I personally love the outdoor reset model and, and modulating that water temperature. Also, when we start looking at the I-valve, there's a lot of different versions of it. And also even, even the thermostatics. So, and, and we went over this, Rick, did we talk about CV last week? No, not Two last week. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about CV today, too. Um, so let's look at the thermostatic uh, uh, CV. And I'll, I'll tell what CV is, and we'll, we'll go through some of that stuff right after this. So the thermostatic mixing valve has a CV, a 2.3 for a three-quarter inch thermostatic heat-only valve. We look at the 2AI valve, and that has a CV, a 10.3. We look at the three-way I-valve in a union format has a CV of 5.8. And the reason why I bring up the union one here instead of a threaded or a sweat, the beauty of this union valve is if you had a union thermostatic installed in a project, this will fit right in its place. And not necessarily from Taco to Taco. It could also be across platforms and, and cross manufacturers. So if you had a system that had a standard thermostatic in there and you wanted to put in a, uh, a modulation, uh, you can go with the union. If you had a union valve, you can go with the union I valve to fit right in there. And then there's the four way valve. Uh, and the four way has a CV a 7.0. So, what is CV? Well, the CV definition is yeah, I'm going to read right off the screen, John. I know you don't want me to, but I will. <laughs> it's the point at which a particular device or system will impart one PSI pressure drop on the fluid passing through it. So what that means, if I were to flow that gallons per minute, that CV number is a gallons per minute through a device, you'll have one PSI pressure drop, which is an additional 2.3 foot ahead in your system itself. So I know we did this when we started talking about our zoning. And we talked about the zone sentry zone valve. The three-quarter inch zone valve has a CV of 10.3. So if we were to take a, a, a zone sentry zone valve 
and let's say our system is 15 PSI in there, and we've got three-quarter inch pipe, and we put a pressure gauge on the uh, suction side or on one side of the valve and the other side of the valve, if I were to flow 10.3 gallons a minute through that valve, on the other side of the valve, it will now be 14 PSI. All right, that's an additional pressure drop. Now we know we're not going to run 10.3 gallons a minute through three quarter inch pipe. We know that, all right? We're typically designing our systems to do four gallons a minute. So um, the higher the CV, the better it is for us. It's less pressure drop that we see in the system. So like I said, if we look at the 5000 series mixing valve has a CV of 2.3, you wanna calculate what the head loss is and maybe which valve you want to use in the system itself. So here's our formula. You, it, to find the calculated head is our gallons per minute of our design. Divide that by the CV and square it, then multiply it by 2.31. So here, our example, we had that 25,000 BTU heat loss of the structure that we had at two and a half gallons a minute, CV at 2.3. When we do the math, we come in as a an additional head loss of 2.7 foot ahead. We have to add that onto the head loss of the pipe that we did before. So we did that earlier, a uh, couple of sessions ago. Uh, so now you need to add that additional 2.7 foot ahead in there and hopefully your circulator is going to fit in that realm. Why look at using an I valve with a higher CV? So let's take a look at the three-way valve and do that same math as before, 5.8 CV. <clears throat> we have an additional 0.4 foot ahead. The, 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 the point of the story here is use a valve that has the highest CV that you can get because then it's kind of like throwing a rock in the pond to see the water level rise. You're not going to see it. It's not going to change any levels at all. So you get that head loss down low and now it's not going to affect your circulator sizing. And I used to experience that a lot in the radiant world. I would see a lot of uh, systems that just weren't performing because we had thermostatic valves thrown in and a high pressure drop and the circulator wasn't the right circ in there. It was just too low of a head that we can get out of the system itself. Now, which valves do you use? You know, do you go with two-way valves? Do you go with three-way valves? Do you use a four-way valve? Well, if you remember the four-way down here on the bottom of our curve, our charts here, uh, is has a CV of seven. So here's our piping diagram. It's still using primary, secondary. Our boiler's on the right-hand side, and we throw the I-valve in, and we branch off, and we can go to multi-systems this way, right? And what we end up with, the I-valve, has a it's, it's got an extra port. So by having a four-way valve with an extra port, CV is going to be a lot higher, less pressure drop in there. So yes, in our application today, the three-way is going to work just as is just as well. It's, it doesn't have uh, really any head loss whatsoever. Now, the two-way would be an injection-style system. And when you look at an injection, we're still going to do a primary-secondary piping, uh, but then we need to throw in a balancing valve or a globe valve here so we can really shunt the flow going back into what we need into the system itself. So depending on what you need to do, there's an application for it with the two-way, three-way, or the four-way valve itself. And that's pretty much all I got based on the time period. Didn't want to go keep on going here, unless you guys got anything else to add. Uh, there were a couple. There were a couple of questions. Um, okay. They wanted to. to, to, to uh oh. From uh, from from Rich McGrath about would you ever mm -hmm. use a go with a lower C or a, a smaller valve. Uh, like say you had one inch piping, would you ever go with a three quarter inch, you know, a uh, three way valve? Which um... uh oh, looks like we may be losing John there. So I would say yes, I would. Uh, so it doesn't do as much hunting either. So that's also another big thing. So very small changes in that valve, all right, can change the water temperature really fast. So if you start looking at this system here. And if my boiler had a high temp system at 180 degree boiler, and if we saw 180 coming into port B here, and we only needed say 130 out here, we might not be um, a lot of movement of the valve to inject in that 180 degrees, because we're gonna use a lot more return water coming back to go from 180 
down to 120. So yeah, you might want to undersize the valve just so it doesn't hunt. At small changes all of a sudden slugs it with a ton of hot water and the valve says, oh wait, too much, back up. Oh wait, right. nope, I got to open some more. Got to go back and forth there. So we got to really watch that. I just uh, canceled my webcam for a little bit. My my connection slowed down. So I'm just going to talk without you seeing me, which may be the best way for, for anybody to hear me. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, yeah, it's a valve authority. You want to you want to narrow that hunt a little bit. And then it was an interesting question from Jeff Kelly: Would a would a variable speed pump make up for the CV? Well, no. I, I think it's 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 additional head. It's not going to. We got to remember, Jeff. These things aren't magic. All right. No matter what people say out there, they're not magic, and they don't do the thinking for you, and they don't take the thinking out of it. They do specific things. So if you have a, let's say you have a take a 0015 E3 um, set to medium, you know, medium, the medium setting, it's going to maintain a 10 foot ahead constant pressure differential. All it is is a flat curve pump. If you throw that, throw that valve with the CV on it and the head pressure jumps up, jumps from say, you know, go, goes up to, to 13 or 14 feet ahead in the system, the pump's not going to be able to do anything with that. It's just going to stay on the 10 foot ahead constant pressure setting. And there's no magic button that you push that's going to say, oh, well, we'll just magically adjust for that. That's not how that works. So so I guess the answer is, is you know, not necessarily to a, to a borderline, no. They, they'll, it, 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 they're not that smart, I guess. The, the one that might have a fighting chance, the one that might have a fighting chance, Jeff, is the, the Delta T pump. Because it's going to try to maintain a de, a, the Delta T you've designed for. So if you throw a little bit of extra head loss in there, well, it still knows the you know the flow rate's going to be what the flow rate's going to be. The head's going to be higher to maintain that delta T that we're looking for. The pump may very well run faster. So the the delta T pump's going to give you a fighting chance. A delta P pump, not so much. Good, good, very good question. Very good question. Let me. Uh, 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 there was. Go I'm ahead. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, Richard McGrath was uh, the one talking about the smaller diameter valve. Um, Generally speaking, the the actual mixing valve within the whole tally of pressure drop can and should be as high as 25, 30% of the total pressure drop. When, when we get a valve to be that much of the pressure drop, you get better uh, valve authority and you get the, uh, the valve to quit hunting as much. That's already been explained, but I just want to throw out that number. It's generally speaking, this goes way back in the days of Robert Bean and, and Dan Foss days. Um, yeah, 25, 30%. Some people have gone even higher, but in the days of trying to get our circulators smaller and not use the Benford 5000 for everything, we're, uh, we're, we want to do it that way. So, um, and Wheels had another one. Uh, he's just talking about the, the, the two-way example that you were showing there, Dave with mm -hmm. the um uh the balancing valve the balancing valve in that drawing steve is nothing more than creating pressure differential across those two t's uh, so that the eye valve will work a properly sized two-way eye valve we won't have to balance and make the valve smaller so to speak you're uh, i'm almost thinking we're going back to injection days when we put the globe valve in there to make the pump smaller uh, nowadays, with two-way valve, uh, we're not trying to do that. We're just uh, we appropriately size the two-way valve, and that bigger globe valve that's on the uh, secondary system is nothing more than pressure differential across those two T's. And I, I saw another question come in: Can I put multiple circulators on a three-way valve? Oh yes, definitely. Oh yeah. Um, uh, as you can see uh, in the uh, that I that I showed in the four-way valve. Uh, uh, configuration. So yes, you can do multiple um, circulators coming off of it, and that could be based on how you zone the system, whether you zone by zone valve or zone by circulator. So you can, and obviously just size the circulator, I mean, size the valve based upon your flow rate of all zones calling at the same time. So most definitely. Um, and And here's also another good thing about a modulating valve when used in a radiant system and i i've seen projects that have had four five six different water temperatures 
and usually with thermostatics because then they start putting in more and more valves based on the water temperature designs going out to these different areas and different zones out to the house. You start modulating the water temperature. Yeah, you might have a zone that needs 150 degrees and then you have another one that needs 130 and then another one that needs 110. You can kind of start combining them because those numbers are only based upon design day, which is 2% of the winter, right? So once we start getting warmer outside, those design water temperatures actually start getting closer to each other. So we start making the mechanical room less complicated, taking up less space out there. So uh, whether you do zone valve, zone pumps, um, but we try to, I try to minimize with modulation of a valve, um, less mixing valves to show up in a project. So it's less complicated. So there we go. And Very we're good. back at it. Yes. I got one more question here. Again, a follow up from Jeff Kelly. Uh, concern me because we were using the variable speed for maximizing the delta T, but usually can't get the split in the delta T better than 10 as the weather gets warmer. Jeff, that circulator is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Uh, not a lot of people acknowledge this, but it has a minimum speed. And as it gets warmer, it's going to get, you know, the system, as it gets warmer, the pump's going to go slower and slower and slower until it hits that minimum speed. And then it's when it's at that minimum speed, it's at that minimum speed. It's now a nine watt fixed speed pump, yeah. right? And that's, that's kind of how it is. It's not going to be, it's not going to do anything else. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing at that point. So, yeah. so good. I'm glad we got that one squared away. Alrighty. I want to try, I'm, I'm, looks like I'm going to have to put 20 minutes worth of stuff into 10 minutes. <laughs> when we're talking about indirects so let, let's let's get started and see how the how, how this goes all right and we also still have trivia questions and things like that uh for you actually let's do the trivia question right now uh let's do the trivia question right now and uh, type in your answers to the trivia question and we'll take all the correct answers uh by the time we're done we'll take all the correct answers and we'll put them into a hopper and we'll we'll pick the winner all right, uh, we'll pick a winner next week. You'll all be eligible. We're gonna pick last week's winner in a little bit here. Next week, we're gonna pick this week's winner, like clear as mud, right? Okay, <laughs> let's make sure we do that. <laughs> all righty, so the Takeo trivia question of the night is this. Uh, as we've mentioned many times, Takeo is a third generation family business celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. John Hazen White Jr., Jr., who I believe is on with us tonight, is the owner, and the fourth generation has earned leadership uh, positions with Takeo and is currently working in the company and, and, and working towards uh, their, their leadership uh, positions. The question is, what are the names of Johnny's two sons? What are the names of Johnny's two sons? All right. And um, type in your answers into the question section, and we will uh, we'll collect them all. And uh, between now and when we flip all the cards and then uh you know we'll pick we'll pick a winner for the prize next week and we i think we have some pretty good stuff coming up here too so uh let's uh type in what type them in when you know them all righty and let's talk about circulators and indirects now what we're going to talk about what to use and what not to use uh indirects are, are kind of cool things you got to understand specs they give you these spec sheets man and there's just so much stuff here what does it all mean what is all this i see i see all this crazy stuff on these two different charts and, and the, this one comes from a uh, from a superstore, but they're they're all very similar. I got a column there that tells me the model. That's good. It tells me the capacity, how much water's in the tank. That's good to know too. It's telling me the recommended flow rate through the heat exchanger. That's really important to know, as well as as well as the pressure drop in feet ahead through that heat exchanger. Huh? That's really good to know too. And then I've got first hour ratings. At a, with 180 degree boiler water and whether it tells me the ratings whether I'm storing at 140 degrees in the tank or 115 in the tank and then 200 degree boiler water for the same with the same with the same temperatures so this tells us a lot of interesting stuff and there's two charts there's the top chart and the bottom chart and the top chart's the happy chart the top chart's the the, the, the one that makes us all smile and makes us look good and 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 feel good and all that other stuff the top chart giveth okay so let's say we're using the SSU 45. This is telling us we have 45 gallons on hand. That's a lot of hot water, man. And it's also telling us, depending if the 180 degree boiler water, depending upon what we're what we're storing, what temperature we're storing at, we either have 212 gallons or 292 gallons for that first hour. 
well, 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 Glorioski, Captain Kilowatt, what's not to like? I mean, this is great stuff. This is that that'll fill anything. I'm I'm I, these things are amazing. Well, the bottom chart holds us accountable. The bottom chart taketh away if the bottom chart giveth. And the bottom chart's real sneaky about it, too. It starts out innocently enough. It gives us a bunch of dimensions and things, okay? A uh, Florida boiler supply, nine inches. Florida boiler return, four and a half inches. Hmm, that tells me the boiler return's the one on the bottom, man. I'm smart enough to figure that out. It tells me the shipping weight, 88 pounds. Okay, I better have help bringing this thing down the stairs. And then it gives, then it gives me that, 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 you know, that roundhouse from out of left field. I will get that rating. I will get that performance if and only if with 180 degree wa boiler water, if and only if I have 141,000 BTUs net available at the boiler. If I don't have 141,000 net output boiler, I will not get those first hour ratings. That's just the way it is. And believe it or not, there's some math behind that. No. Any tank, any tank, 75% usable capacity, all right? You, you don't have all 45 gallons available to you. You get about three quarters of that available to you before you start to draw down simply because there's coil space in there, it's taken up some space. And when you empty the tank, you fill it up with cold water. So you gotta figure about 75% or so uh, of usable capacity within that tank for like a hot water dump. So in this case, 45 gallons times 0.75, 75%, that means we got about 34 gallons available of 140 degree water to dump in that, in that tank. Now let's talk recovery, all right? The, the, the rest of this is all recovery. And re figuring recovery is fairly easy. It's all about BTUs and GPM. It's not how many GPM do I need to deliver a certain amount of BTUs to a zone. It's how many gallons per minute can I recover based on the BTUs I have available. All right, what do I have available for BTUs from my boiler? So let's do a little bit of math. Here's, the, here's, the, here's your, your formula for figuring output, or figuring recovery rather for any indirect. It's your, your net DOE boiler output, the net boiler output, divided by 8.33 times 60 times 90. That comes up to 44,000 and change, let's call it 45,000, close enough. Where do those numbers come from? Well, 8.33 we know is, uh, is, is, is how, much a, uh, the pounds of, uh, how much a gallon of water weighs. A gallon of water weighs 8.33 pounds. 60 is the number min of minutes in an hour. And 90 is the DOE recommended temperature rise for your water from 50 to 140 in this case. So 8.33 times 60 times 90 is about 44,000 and change. We'll call that 45,000. So let's do the math, okay? Let's get put on our Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa Vito hat and let's do the math, all right? 141,000 divided by 8.33 times 60 times 90 or call it 45,000 is gonna equal 3.13 gallons per minute of recovery. That means I can recover at a rate of just over three gallons a minute. Eh, we're gonna call it three. Okay, we're gonna call it three. I can recover 140 degree water at a rate of three gallons per minute. Now, what does that mean over the course of an hour? Well, simply multiply that by 60, that's 180 gallons. So three gallons per minute times 60 minutes, I, gotta, I can recover up to 180 gallons per hour, per hour. Now, let's add that to what we have stored. I got 34 gallons stored. I got 180 gallons recovered. That's 214 first hour gallons. Well, you remember the chart said the, the chart said 212, close enough, all right? So for that first hour, I can turn on a spigot. I can turn on a spigot and have it run at three and a half gallons per minute. I'll, I'll for that first full hour, that water temperature won't change. It'll be 140 gallons, 140 degrees coming out of that spigot if I wanted it to be, all right, three and a half, if I set it to three and a half gallons a minute, boom, over for that full hour, three and a half gallons a minute of 140 degree water will be flowing out of that tub. If I set it to seven gallons a minute, I would have 30 minutes worth of, of, three, of 140 degree water before it started to draw down. That's kind of how all that works. Now, we're not taking a bath in 140 degree water, right? Well, at least not twice. We're, we're going to be we're going to be uh, tempering somewhere, somewhere, whether it's at the fixture, whether it's at the tank, we're going to be tempering somewhere. So that's what gives us a lot of leeway with indirects. We can do a lot wrong with indirects and still get away with it because we store at a high temperature and we, draw, we, we mix down. So it, it covers up a lot of mistakes, a lot of sins. And here are some of those big ifs that we have to be, be careful of. 
we have conditions, all right? First, you need 141,000 BTUs at the boiler. Yes, I'm sure to get that, you need 141,000 BTUs at the boiler. I'm also sure that the boiler piping has to be proper. The pipe has to be sized appropriately. I know there may be a three quarter inch tapping on the indirect. That doesn't mean you can only run three quarter inch pipe to that to that indirect. If you need say 10 gallons a minute, you gotta, you gotta put pipe 10 gallons a minute. You're gonna need one inch pipe going to that indirect and drop down to three quarter inch. It's pressure drop at that point. It's not flow restriction. We're not cutting the flow, it's pressure drop. We gotta get 10 gallons a minute to that heat exchanger and we can only do that with one inch pipe or bigger. All right, so we need proper boiler piping. Yes, I'm sure, I'm positive. In addition, we also have to pick the right circulator. I gotta be able to deliver the flow and overcome the head loss just like in anything else, okay? So let's let's take a look. What's that gonna look like? And here's the other thing. Let's We'll take a look at that, but also what if we have a smaller boiler? What if I don't have 141,000 BTUs in the boiler? What if I what if I'm I'm sizing the boiler to the house load and not the domestic load? Is that is that a recipe for disaster? Might be. You know, let's see. Again, we use this formula. Let's say I've got a 75,000 BTU boiler. The net output of that boiler is 75,000 divided by 45,000. Now you see what's happened to my recovery. I'm down to 1.67 GPM times 60 minutes. Now I've got 100 first hour gallons worth of recovery plus the 34 I have stored, all right? I have 34 stored with the 100 gallons recovered, right? That's 134 first hour gallons. Now I have to to two and a quarter gallons per minute. And at that point, I'll get Uh -oh. gallons per minute of 100, uh, 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 140 degree water. And that's not, that is a fact, right? That is a fact, all right? See, she was smart, that one, Miss Marissa to me. All right, so these are things that, and, and can we still get away with that? Yeah, we probably can get away with that. Are we gonna be okay? There's a really good chance, yeah, that provided everything's piped, piped properly. Now, if we go back to the chart, we see our recommended flow rate uh, for this thing is 10 gallons per minute, all right? 10 gallons per minute and 7.9 feet ahead, all right? So 7.9 feet ahead through the coil, 10 gallons a minute through the, through the, through the coil itself. So if I, was, if I had 141,000 BTUs available, all right, and I'm working off, generally these things are sized to about a 30 degree delta T, I'm gonna need that 10 gallons a minute. For 10 gallons a minute, I'm gonna to have to run one inch pipe. But in this example, we're sizing to a 75,000 BTU boiler, not 141,000. Well, it's gonna be a little bit different. I don't have that, I don't have that much, that many BTUs available. So GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. In this case, let's go 30 times 500. Now I'm down to about five gallons a minute. And the head loss at that point is only going to be two feet ahead. All right, it's only going to be two feet ahead through that coil. Uh, it means I'm going to have a smaller circulator. So five gallons a minute, I'm still looking at one inch pipe, maybe three quarter, but one inch, possibly one inch pipe to that to that heat exchanger. Uh, additional head through that piping is going to be about 3.2 feet of extra head, uh, plus the two feet ahead through the, the, the 3.2 feet ahead through the piping two feet ahead through the heat exchanger, that's 5.2 feet ahead. So in this case, I'm gonna need a circulator that can do five gallons a minute at a little over five feet ahead. In the other scenario, I would have needed a circulator that would do 10 gallons a minute at about 10 and a half feet ahead. If we look at three speed circulators, uh, in the first scenario, I've got a 0015 standard efficiency at, at about high, at high speed, all right? 10 gallons a minute at 10 feet ahead. In the other scenario, I could bump that down to low speed. I'd have that nice 30 degree delta T. I won't be short cycling or anything, and I'll be getting the performance that I'm looking for out of that out of that um, out of that indirect with 75,000 BTUs available. I'm not going to have that 212 gallons per 212 first hour gallons. I'm going to have something less. But again, in a lot of cases, we're tempering at the fixture. We're doing all this kind of stuff. 
this is how you get away with a lot, all right, with indirects. Now understand there's that perfect storm out there someplace and someone's gonna install that that six person car wash style shower. So they so so they and five of their closest friends can all shower together uh, and, and you, you, it blows all your plans. Uh, just so those perfect storms are out there, but just understand that that a lot of times you can get away with certain mistakes here. And as long as you're storing at 140 and tempering down, in many many cases under normal conditions you're not going to have that you're not it's not going to bite you in the in the in the tuchus you might have that situation where two people are taking a shower at the same time in different bathrooms and all of a sudden after 10 or 12 minutes it starts to you, the water won't be quite as hot yeah that's reality okay that's reality so how do we get a an existing tank to perform better all right well we can use a tempering valve all right, we can add a tempering valve at the tank. All right, it, basically what it does is it makes the tank think it's bigger. It gives it delusions of grandeur, if you will. It makes a 45 gallon tank think it's a think it's bigger, think it's a 60 or an 80 gallon tank. If we temper at the tank itself, and then may, we still may be tempering out at the fixtures. It, it certainly depends. How big is this going to? How much is this going to help? And this is good. This is good for any application, any water heater, not just an indirect. Any water heater, we can use this map to figure out how much more usable storage we're going to have. So it's a two-part math formula. The first one is this: uh, T mix minus T ink divided by T stored minus T ink equals the storage factor. We we understand what these things are, right? T mix, temperature mix. That's the mix. That's the temperature you're sending out of that tempering valve. It's the mixed temperature. T ink, that's the incoming temperature, the temperature of the water coming out the ground. Divided by T stored, that's the temperature of the water stored in the tank minus T ink. All right, we do that math and we get what we call a storage factor, a storage factor. All right, let's do one. All right, let's do one to create capacity. Let's say, we are we are mixing our water down to 112 degrees. That may sound like an arbitrary number, but we'll explain it in a second. We're mixing down to 112 degrees, and uh, the we have uh, the the um, incoming water is 50 degrees, and we're storing it at 140. All right, we're storing at 140. So 112 minus 50 divided by 140 minus 50. That's 62 divided by 90. That's a 0.69 storage factor. To once we have the storage factor, now we can apply that to our stored capacity. What we'll do is we'll divide the usable capacity by the storage factor, and that'll give us our tempered capacity. So remember, our tank, our, our tank had a usable capacity of 34 gallons. 34 gallons divided by 0.69 now gives us a usable tempered capacity in that tank of nearly 50 gallons of nearly 50 gallons. So we've increased that tank's capacity by nearly 50%, all right? We've by nearly 50%. So again, usable capacity divided by your storage factor equals the tempered capacity. So that's part one. Part two is what would happen if we decided to push the old envelope, all right? Let's push the old envelope a little bit here and let's see what we come up with. Let's say we store at 160. All right, let's say for giggles and grins, we're storing at 160. So 112 divided by 50 divided by 160 minus 50 equals 62 divided by 110. That's a 0.56 storage factor. 0.3 or 34 gallons divided by 0.56. Now that gives us a usable capacity, a tempered capacity of 60 gallons. And that's the same capacity as an 80 gallon tank. That's the same usable capacity as an 80 gallon tank. So what we've sorta of kinda of done here is we've turned a 45 gallon tank into an 80 gallon tank simply by storing higher and tempering down, all right? Now, is a storing temperature, a storing water at 160 degree temperature gonna use more energy than 140? Well, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, that's the price we pay for maybe having a, a tank that's not big enough for what I need to do, all right? So there's there's the, there's the there's the rub, so to speak. But yeah, that's how that's certainly how we work that out. Now yeah, I I did that exactly in my house. Yeah. So um because I went from a family of four to a family of six when the in-laws moved in and I needed some more capacity. We put an addition on the house and added um 
you know, another bath in there, another kitchen, another laundry room. So, um, so I cranked up that water temperature because I had a small tank in my house originally, and my boiler room is a closet. So that I was, if I would have put in an 80 gallon tank in my, in my mechanical room, I've got stuff on the wall I wouldn't see again. <laughs> It'd be covered by that tank. So, which is <laughs> manifolds and pumps and stuff back there. So, um, so I, cr- I put the, I had the mix valve in there, cranked up the temperature of my indirect and uh, rock and roll, more than enough hot water. There you go. Hey, I want to go back one here, one slide here. And Dave, uh, you, I, I'm going to ask you to explain this to everybody. What's with the 112? All right. And it, it has to do with specific tempering valves. And it's not every tempering valve, uh, but that, it has to do with how tempering valves work. So why don't you take that one? That's correct. Yeah. So um, it was more important in the earlier screen when we had 140 as our storage temperature uh, in the se- in the system itself. So here at 160, we're okay there. But when we had 140, we chose 112. So probably taking the valve and turning it down because most of them come out of the box set for 120. And that is because depending upon the model of, of, of mixing valve, a lot of them are looking for a 27 degree spread between the storage temperature or meaning the hot temperature coming in and the mix going out. Some of them can get down a little lower. Uh, but a lot of them do look at a, uh, a at least a 27 degree spread or more in order for it to operate properly. Otherwise, you get, you know, you don't get the right thermostatic operation of the valve. It's not a motor. It's just that wax element on the inside. So it needs to see that temperature difference. And I know Rick always knows uh, the difference in the code numbers. I can never remember the numbers of the codes on which one is which. Some of them are 10. Some of them are 27. Right, and and if you and if you used a twenty a, a valve that required that twenty seven degree temperature difference, and you set it up for for a ten degree temperature difference, you'd get sandwiching, right? You'd you'd have a very inconsistent water temperature control. So the water'd be hot, then it'd be cool, and be hot, then be cool. Um, we have valves that are twenty seven degree temperature differentials, and we have valves that are ten degree temperature differentials. So it just a matter you just got to make sure you know what you're choosing. When you're looking at the specs, make sure you pick the valve that's going to do what you want it to do. So, like I said, we have both. Very good. Very good. want to do a couple things here. Um, First things first, the trivia answer. An awful lot of you guys get it. So, here we are. As of 8.11, as of 8.11, no more answers, uh, but an awful lot of people had them. And the, the, oops, sorry, the correct answer here is John or J3 and Ben. So those are the those are John's two sons who will who are in the process of 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 working their way into the into take a management and uh, to, to find young two fine young men as well. So we're 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 we're, we're happy to be working with those guys. So hey, those John. are then that's that's take out the next generation right there. Hey John, somebody had answered two youths. Does that count? Yeah, they're two. <laughs> <laughs> they're two youths. Yes, and two I represent youths. them. Two youths, yeah. Yes, Johnny's Dan, two youths. Yeah. Dan, I did write that. I did write your name down just to record it, just because I like the creativity behind it, brother. You know what? That's going to count as a right answer in my book. Yeah, yeah. That's what. That's going to count as a right answer. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, uh, Dave. Let's. Yes, uh, before we talk about next week, where well, we're going to see you youths next week. Uh, why don't I turn this over to you? We got to pick our winner from last week, correct? And again, folks, we're going to stay on as long as you want. We already got a bunch of questions here ready to rock. Uh, so we're going to tee those up right after we we select the um, the winner from last week's trivia. So let me uh, yes. turn this over to you. Oh, I'll just take my camera. I'll just throw the camera. So if you want to minimize your screen. Oh, no, you want to. I'm going to give it to you, man. Okay, crap. Uh, let me move this around. <laughs> it's such a pain in the neck when I got three screens. Uh, to making sure I could see everything here. So let's see. Oh, you want, me, you want me to just take it back then? No, no, no. Let me open that. Uh, show screen. Uh, I can get it. Only because I've got so many windows open. One second. All right, there we go. So, but last week... We had uh, the question of where did the 007 name come from, um, and it was due to our product manager um, as a as a big James Bond fan. And there were quite a few answers that came out of that. And what we plan on doing for this, uh, who, the winner 
is going to get a VT2218 circulator. Yeah, man. So uh, you can see the screen now. We got you. All right. So I put the names in. Those of our winners, those are the, the correct answers from last week. So let me uh, tap the screen and see who is going to be our big winner for a VT2218. Round and round she goes where it stops. Oh, oh Brandon, oh. Sean, Brandon, and Sean. <laughs> Sean knows. Sean McGovern. All right, Sean. <laughs> Woohoo! All right, Sean, I will contact you. Um, I'll send you an email, and I will get your information to, uh, to send that out to you. Excellent. And excellent, let me excellent. stop hey, sharing the screen. Mr. Messenbrink. I noticed John Johnny White's hand is up. Should we uh, bring well, him on? Yeah. Well, of course. Absolutely. John, we're going to unmute you here. All right. John, how are you guys? We are yeah. awesome, sir. How are you doing? You know what? Absolutely great. Holy mackerel. I can't believe I'm, I'm live on this thing. Uh, so I was just thinking about my boys, and I just want to make a comment about them. They are absolutely growing well because of you guys. You've all let them grow and develop, and they are so fantastic. How did they get into this thing? I'm just curious, Dave, uh, John. They are so, so many. Let's get that. We 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 need we need uh, we need the 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 younger white presence on uh, on Takeo after dark. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I want to bring them in because you know um, for this group and for these people, they are just the best in the world, and I'm so proud of them. And I just miss not having them here tonight. But I will tell you, I'll drag them in next week. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because they should be here. And I got to tell you, they are amazing. They love this industry so much. They picked up where I left off, I guess. Somewhere, but they're amazing. And to this group and to all you people, they just are part of this. And it's amazing to watch them grow and develop because of you, what, we, what you've done and what they've been able to learn from all this it's just a great thing i just want to say that because i'm so proud of them so proud of them yeah it's 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 uh it's great when you you see your kids become you know functional adults and are you know are, are forging their own way and uh and and you know I, I feel i feel that way with my kids too watching them become i remember you know little rugrats running around the house in diapers and now they're they're you know they're doing things that I only dreamed of doing, so it's it, it is very very cool. You know, Johnny, with those boys, I just have to say this uh, one time. Um, I've watched them grow and develop from babies, and they're only in this company because they love the people. They love the people. They they could have done their. Do you know, like me, they never had business education. John was an English major and Ben was a psychology major. And um, I was an English major. And my dad was too. But, you know, um, they just plain stayed with me for their whole life because they grew up in a house with an old father who just loved the people. And they stuck with that. And they're here. And I say to them sometimes, why do you stay? They will say, because of you, Dad. Because mm. of the way we love the people. And it's not just the employees, because we do love them. Of course, you all know that, but yep. it's all of the customers. And the people that we do business with, the suppliers and the community and everything else. Those boys, they love this world, and they love the people. I'm really proud of them. 
and just good to be able to share that with you all of you because remember this this is an old man talking now <laughs> and i have two great boys who can take this and run and they will do that because they love all of you and all of us just like i have for my whole life sorry to take the time but oh no no worries you know what that tells me that tells me the next time i'm i, I want to stick around for the next hundred years i just uh i just so love this company and what we do and watching this thing with you guys it's amazing it's just amazing you know you're so in the weeds with the details i don't understand <laughs> the heat transfer flow and all this stuff i'm, I'm not really a, a, a wonk with that but i do know the history of this company and by the way dave holder if i gotta tell you something yes sir do you know who so i was watching that thing do you know who invented the hot water mixing valve Yes, didn't didn't we? Um, well, I know we at Taco did come out with one in 27. I wasn't sure if we actually invented it or not, but I know we had one in the 1900 era. My grandfather, with his partner of uh, Bob Landing, invented that thing. Okay, and um. It's interesting when you think about the history because we don't talk about that so much, but this company has developed and created so many good things. Uh, air elimination. Think about that. That was Taco. We did that with the air scoop in the 1900s, early 1900s. The mixing valve. That was ours. I mean, so many of those things. And so now we talk about the high tech part of that. But man, I'll you know I'll go back. We did a lot of great stuff, and now we just have really high tech stuff. It's amazing, but you guys are teaching it now, and to watch that and hear it, it's it's amazing. Congratulations, like the old man I, just sits back and watches, and it's it's. <laughs> Well, we, we were, we're, we're two, two of us are old men on this end too. Dave's still the young buck of the group. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's still, he's, yeah. Rick, Rick and I, however, aren't all that far behind you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. But, but I just love watching this stuff and hearing you guys. And I just I so appreciate the people that take the time to be on this thing at night and spend that time. Thank you because. It matters to me and to Takeo to be able to share time with all of you. That matters to me so much you can't believe. I just love this company. I love this industry and I love the people. And thank you. Thank you for allowing that little time. But what a great thing you guys have done. Well, well thank, thank you, John. John and, uh, thank you. Next week we got to have the boys on for sure. If we can get them get them rounded up, we should have them on next week. I shall I shall push them for that. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me about Tago while I'm on? Yeah, guys, if you have any uh, anybody out there with uh, with questions about Tago, anything any specific questions for Johnny? I mean, how often do you get the the owner of a of a hundred year old uh, manufacturer? Uh, with you online on a Wednesday night, you know, after dark. So is, if you guys have any questions for Johnny, please ask. He, he, any questions, fair game. Absolutely. I just love that moment. There you go. Uh, Mike Westgard asks if you need a third son. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Mike, you know, actually, I'm not sure if I don't have one. I, I, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, and here's one uh, from Jarrett Gluck. What is the origin of the name Taco? So that's a great question. So, uh, you know, my grandfather started this company 
1920. He was a salesman for um, a boiler company, National Radiator, and he broke away because he wanted to have other products to surround the boiler, right? And so he created Taco. He bought some broken down little company that was doing a thing with a water heater, but Taco comes from Thermal Appliance Company. So it's an acronym, right? Thermal Appliance Company. And that's what it was. And the, he, he went on to develop, um, as I said, you know, the, well, first the he developed the tankless water heater. That was his invention. And still they're sold, the tankless coils. Mm -hmm. But um, went on to develop the um, uh, air separator and the um, mixing valve and oh, so many more things. It's interesting, but it's a great question. So it's thermal appliance company. That was Taco's origination. Yep. A lot of guys have asked me, how come you named it after a Mexican treat? And I said, no, 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 that's not, that's not taco. Oh, it's taco. No, no, it works, though. It does work. <laughs> I, I could tell the stories about that. Well, I won't now, but. <laughs> but uh, uh, let's see. Uh, here, here's something from Dan Cook. Tell Johnny thanks for supporting Wild McLean with products. Uh, and these three guys at our training sessions in Michigan City. And uh, from Peter Kupchik, not a question, but a thank you. I've been using Taco products for over 35 years, always dependable. I hope to continue for another 35. Thank you and stay healthy. Well, thank you so much. And I will tell you, by the way, uh, Wild McLean. So I got to tell you this story. Real quick, <laughs> I was uh, my first job at Taco was it was a nothing job, but my second job or whenever I came back, I was working in the factory for years. And when I got up in the echelon somewhere, uh, I was given the job of creating the OEM division. We didn't have one of those at that point, and I created that and began calling on the boiler guys. It was Wild McLean, and, um, H. B. Smith at the time, and oh my gosh, uh, Burnham and and Wild and Burnham were so loyal to us and gave us a chance uh, to be who we are. And I look back at this time, and oh, they all were great. Oh, New Yorker Steel Boiler, and oh my gosh, Peerless, and they all just gave us a chance, but while it was special to me because I had a great relationship there and I could walk in and be in the factory. You can't do that anymore, but man, I, I just loved those days. That was in the eighties and yeah, I just, uh, wow. Was a, that's a great company. So thanks for asking about that, but just love those guys. And you're getting a shout out from Jason Mangos too. Uh, thank you from Jason and from NTI. And uh, uh, he's another big fan. And uh, here's one from Carlton Pember. Where do you think Taco will be in the next 100 years and how do you stay on the cutting edge? Well, you know, was that Jason, did you say? Uh, that was this, was, this one's from Carlton Pember. Oh, Carl. so let me, let me say this. I would say that, um, I've worked my whole life to build a company that cares about people and and cares about the customers, cares about everybody, I guess, the community and all we have. And we've had a company that's done something back. And here's my thought. You know, I just plain want to make this a white family company. I just want to keep this in the white family and to make it great for people. I, you know, I believe this. There is nothing that's better than a family owned business because that just brings the family home. And I'll take that and go with it for the rest of my life. And I will tell you this, back to what we talked about earlier, those two white boys 
young men are so solid and so strong that I now believe that this company can be driven forward, keeping my mission, my goal, solid and worthy. Those young men will make this company better, stronger, and with Cheryl Merchant, my CEO, stronger and better than it ever has been under me. I know they are the best in the world. And so to answer your question, where's it gonna be in whenever? It's gonna be here with me in my heart, with all of you, with what we've done and where we go will always be with the people, with the customers, with the community and with our employees. What more can I say? Yeah, not much more needs to be said after that, I'll tell you. Yeah, I, I uh, as an employee, you know, I, I got to, and maybe this is, I don't know if this is the right place to say it or not, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it's just, it's, it's, it's there, is that working for Takeo, understand this, people, working for Takeo isn't a job, it's, it's, it's an obligation. And I feel an obligation to, to Dave, to Rick, to, to John, to, 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 the folks on the factory floor to everybody there to do the very best I can. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't want to let that just so for the hundred some odd people still out there. I don't want to let this man talking down in any way, shape or form. You know, you gave me a great opportunity here and it's uh, um, you know, it's, it was a life changing opportunity and um, you know, the right, you know, it, it, you know, for the right kind of person, it was, it was just a, a, a the opportunity of a lifetime. And uh, that's the, that, that kind of that's what motivates me. I want to make sure I work for everybody else. I work for the other 500 people in Cranston. You know, I work for Dave. I work for Rick. I, I work for you, obviously, and I work for Todd. I work for everybody else. To you know, I work for the the folks who clean up and the folks who you know, you know, Jackie, who makes our who makes our our training classes happen. You know, yep. I, I feel like I work for all of those people. You know, Johnny, and thank you because it goes both ways. But never forget, we all work together. And we have something so incredibly special. And it's all about what you're doing right now. When I look at this thing tonight and listen to you guys, it's like amazing because what you've done is nothing short of amazing. To be with people. So you know, I have to tell you this thing. I have one love in my life, and that's sharing time. Oh, I have a lot of loves in my life, Winston and, you know, my, <laughs> but I love sharing time with people. And this is one of those right now, just to spend this time and share this time. Sharing time with people is the, it's a blessing. And you've done that, John. You've done that, Dave, you know, Rick, you, you've done that with people. You've spent this time and they, have shared time with you. And there's nothing more valuable in this life than to share time with each other. And now in this awful, this horrible, weird time that we're in, there's no better thing than to do this because we can't do anything else, right? right? But share this time together. I just, I love it. And I love all of you for spending that time with us because this is just little Taco, not a big guy, but a great place. And thank you for this wonderful chance to share time. That's what I love. I've taken so much time and I'm so sorry, but thank we you. Got to, uh, uh, Ernest Penzel Satter says, just wrote down, applause please for the chairman. So there you go. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> just an old man. I have to tell you, 
I do feel so old now because I have this great team, all of you, and then you're going to take on a look at my team. And by the way, guys, I have to tell you all one thing. As this company moves forward and my boys grow and develop and I fade a little bit, I have the greatest CEO in the world with Cheryl. She is amazing and she shall take this company forward yeah, good. beyond me better than I could ever do, but I'm still here. Yep. Yep. One heck of a dynamic leader she is as well. Um, yeah. It just Best. sees uh, about as straightforward of a person to you. Not, you always know where you're standing. You always know where she's coming from. So that's uh, that is awesome. Yeah, she's a the perfect love, person. Love her to pieces, you know, and to the end of the earth. And I'm still here. Very good. Got a couple of more thank yous. One, Jarrett Gluck says, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, Robert O'Brien, thank you from OSP, OESP for all your support uh, of Robert. our industry. Robert? Robert is there. Robert is special. I know him and so great to be with you. All righty. Well, thank you very much, John, for, for 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 stopping by and saying hello. I mean, like I said, guys, you got to you got to spend uh, some, spend some time with the you know with the owner of uh, with the owner of Taco. It just doesn't always. Oh, no, uh, I just doesn't happen just, all the time. <laughs> Johnny, I love the moment, and thank you for allowing me to uh, unmute myself there and be a little talkative. But wow, oh, there you go, there you go. <laughs> All right, yeah, a couple more. We got that. Bruce Marshall says hello. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Bruce, oh my Steve, gosh. Yeah, Steve Whelan says this was extra special. Terry Turner says thanks for putting your people first. So, uh, folks get it. Folks out there get it. They really do. Rich McGrath says thank you. You know, it's it's good when the uh, you know we feel it every day as as part of the team, as part of the as part of the group, and it, it's 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 good when when it when it when it translates to to customers and and they feel it as well that's uh, that's that means we've succeeded well love you all so much we'll succeed and move on together and surely we're friends and we all do different things and have different ideas but man bring them to us because i love all of you and i love what you think what you want i'm always with that but let's just go together. Awesome. Very good. All righty. Well, thank you, sir. All right, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Johnny. Um, thank see you, you, Johnny. Bye, guys. Take care. All right. That was pretty wild. That was pretty wild. All righty. How do we, how do you, what do you do for an act two there? <laughs> how do we follow that up? I'm turn my webcam on and well let's just real quick i mean questions. we're down about yeah some we got questions. some questions we're down about 100 yeah. folks here uh just a real quick primer on next week we're going to be talking domestic hot water recirculation uh we're going to be talking about uh you know smart ways to do it let's do it right let's do it smart you know let's not take a knucklehead approach and let's not believe in magic either i mean there's no magic out there uh, there's, we can do this intelligently. We don't have to oversize these pumps and we shouldn't oversize <laughs> these pumps and we shouldn't just let them run all the time either because that's bad all around. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about all that kind of stuff next week. Uh, I believe it's also the next big thing, so to speak, because a lot of people over the last two months have been washing their hands in cold water. <laughs> all you got to well, do is bring it up to them. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If you got to wash your hands, you might as well wash them in uh, in hot water, right? Uh, and also, real quick, you want some, some of these cool stickers. Rick, did you ever get your stickers, by the way? I did. I did. You I even did? sent Stop Dave a uh, heads up. Oh, my God. <laughs> I need, I need to Rick, slap them on my, you know, I got my pump, and I need my After Dark sticker right there. Oh, hey, sure. there you go. I like it. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, so just so, you know, those of you that are looking at it, too, so Johnny was talking family. So we were saying here, that's what we put on these things. Family always has your back. You yeah. Know? So that's one of the things that we put on that pump sticker there. there so, go. yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah. So, so again, if you want to, if you want some stickers, uh, reach out to Dave on Instagram uh, at Taco training on Instagram and give him a mailing address. And uh, if you have, if you have stickers, uh, just swap them and we'll, uh, 
we'll 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 uh put put them on our tool chest back at the factory and uh you guys can have some of ours yep. and uh cool is cool is cool all right yeah the wall's growing uh, behind me there you go there you go so got a lot of again we, there were a lot of questions earlier uh one was uh uh how to or how not to use a combi boiler on research uh, yeah we'll definitely discuss that next week wheels that's a that's a, a growing topic on what to do there and how to make that work i'm going to scroll back up here a little bit uh, i got one some, some questions yep go ahead Peter uh, uh, was asking about, he's got a couple of tanks, he's got a boiler, he's doing nothing but DHW production, and he's got the specs from the uh, water heater manufacturer, and he just wants to know, you know, um, he's got a certain amount of GPM and a cert add a certain amount of feet ahead, and he's just wanting to know which ones he adds together, you know, and, and again, Peter, if you're piping parallel, you're going to add the GPM uh, for each coil together, but the pressure drop will be uh, whatever they're saying it is. So, you know, what, I can't remember what your numbers were because that question's way up there now. But double your GPM, or not double it, but add those two numbers together and the head is what the head is, plus whatever the piping, you know, pipe valves and fittings. Uh, so use that to size your circulator. Hopefully that answers your question. Very good, very good. Uh, here's one was interesting. Uh, I'm often asked to compare using a high efficiency ModCon boiler versus an instantaneous wall hung water heater. What do you say? Uh, I'm guessing we're saying using a high efficiency water heater, a high efficiency ModCon with an indirect versus an instantaneous or better better term is tankless water heater. Uh, in terms of making domestic hot water, which which to me it's it's the the correct answer here is yes. Uh, and the difference is one one is storing 40 gallons of water and trying to maintain a temperature all the time, and the other is storing nothing, and it just makes hot water as you need it. Uh, in either case, you got to size, but you got to be careful about sizing both. But I think, in terms of if you're just worried about efficiency, well, I, I would think the, the 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 tankless would be the way to go. Gentlemen, what are you, what are your thoughts? Go ahead, Dave. Uh, I was gonna I was gonna throw it at you, man, because I haven't really <laughs> paid attention to the numbers tightly. You know, I, I there's a lot of variables that are gonna come into play there. I mean, I think one, do you, you do you throw a um, an indirect in there? But hey, a I think a lot of the allure of anything wall hung has been the newfound, so to speak, space that people have in their boiler mm -hmm. room now. You know, or their basement space. I don't have that big tank sitting there anymore. I got a boiler hanging on the wall. Everything's starting to disappear. So I think it. I think it will depend upon that also, and and also the ratings. Uh, I'm seeing some of these combi units where you know you have to go to a, a crazy size just to handle the domestic load. So there's a lot of variables that that really tie into that way. I think anyway, and I, and I'm sure the boiler guys uh, uh, that can answer those questions much better than you and I can. All right. I know I, I just on a, uh, and this is intuitive. This isn't, there's no, I have no data to back this up, but I would imagine if you're just talking about costs, I mean, it, it, your, your, your indirect is a super insulated tank with very, very little standby loss. I mean, there just isn't much there. So it, in terms of costs there, you, you're, you're paying to store 40 gallons of water versus you're paying to store nothing. The fact that there's so little standby loss on an indirect kind of mitigates that somewhat. So I don't know if you're stepping over a dollar to pick up a dime or what here. I, I don't think in, ter in, if, in terms of efficiency, neither's bad, right? Neither's bad. I think if you've got a big honk and tub, you might want storage, uh, enough storage to dump that thing. It's a dump load uh, thing. Yeah, yep. for a dump load. If yep. it's just a normal structure with a sh couple of showers and stuff, then okay. But you still got to size the, the the tankless properly. There's always that challenge. So, yeah. I guess this is a non-answer answer, Peter. I guess it's 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 it falls under the heading of well, it depends. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure if that helped you out, but there you go. All right. What other questions do we have in here, folks? Do 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 two utes. Boy, a lot of people got the questions right. And I like the two utes. That was very good. <laughs> All right. Uh, what are the questions you folks have? I mean, we're down. How many people we have in 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 the house left here? We got 86 of you, so somebody's got to have some questions. Oh, uh, uh, wanted to bring back to Rick. Um, what were the codes based upon the mixing valve? So Mike Lampkin had asked earlier about uh, which valve is 
the 10 degree and which valve is the 27 degree. And I know okay. it's the ASCC numbers. Um, one's ASSE 10 1017 will be about a 27 degree uh, temperature differential. The 1070 is of a 10 degree differential and it's all it has to do with the accuracy of the downward mixed temperature. So you're gonna be really, really accurate if you have that bigger delta on that uh, 1017 valve. So uh, you have to take that into consideration uh, for the sizing and such. So. Right, and it may also be code in your area too. So you might only be able to choose one valve versus the other anyway. So you may not have that opportunity to choose uh, in a domestic system. Uh, one thing, one question that came up here was about uh, instantaneous water use, and I just want to want to talk about the term instantaneous. You lose it, <laughs> don't use yeah. it. Uh, they're tankless water heaters. Tankless. I've had yeah. discussions with. I've had people call me up. I was I was on this TV show a long time ago called I uh, oh god I forget the name of the TV show but we did it was like a this old house copycat thing and we did a thing on domestic hot water research. Oh yeah 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 I remember the show. Yep. Yeah, yeah 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 yeah. It was with the uh, uh, the first one was with Tiffany and the second one was with Robin and that's all that's all I remember from the show. But um we uh uh I, I, they would call, people would call up the, whoever hold, had the show and eventually somebody gave them my phone number. So I'm getting phone calls from people. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know. Um, no thanks. <laughs> yeah. And they said, uh, one, I remember one question. Um, the woman made sure to let me know she was a lawyer. I don't know why, but she made sure to let me know she was a lawyer <laughs> right off the bat. So I, you know, I, <laughs> people probably gonna swear recorded that first. phone call. Uh, but, uh, she want she said why would i use an why would i use your product meaning the research system when i could just buy an instantaneous water heater and it would, it would make the water instantaneous and that was and that's not the first time i've had that question people ask me that question and it's not the last it's it, we got to understand we're dealing with butchers bakers candlestick makers and attorneys at law who aren't you know they they don't know plumbing and heating they don't know what we know uh, we don't know what they know, but but we don't know what we don't they don't know what we know. And I had to say to her, well, yeah, it's going to make that hot water instantaneously, but you still got to get it from where it is to where you want it. I mean, unless you're going to put that thing in the shower with you, you got to get it. You got to facilitate the journey. It's got to get from point A to point B. That's where we come in. One does not necessarily preclude the other. Uh, and it was an inter it's an interesting thing. And you, you you're again understand the language of your customers it's not our language our language is, is very different uh, that's why we talk about outdoor reset one of the things dave said real early on put it in terms that they understand cruise control you know how many coats do you wear during the winter those kinds of things put it into terms that they will understand uh, uh otherwise you know you're it, it's like it, when we when have, has anybody here ever read a legal document right mm -hmm. Do you, do you enjoy it? Do you get it? Do you understand what the hell it's saying? No, because it's not in our language. It's in their language. It's the language of attorneys. Um, so uh, it's the same thing, only different with us. We understand this jargon. We use it every day, but our customers have no idea what the heck we're talking about. So you got to be you got to be able to take two steps back and put our terminology into their language so you're both so you're not you're not talking in fm and they're listening in am so to speak all righty here we go We've got some more uh, uh so, uh dan cook says i like the boiler with the indirect since the boiler exercises all year long our tanks have a 0.4 degree loss per hour and are highly efficient um yeah i i think uh, I, I i absolutely yeah i mean and and there's a there's something to be said for one burner instead of two you know, there's something to be said for one burner instead of two. I, I just simplicity is good. That's just my my. That's how my brain works in 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 as much as in as much as it does. All right. Uh, Polly Silvestri says, I know that can be misleading, but it is still instantaneous. Me personally don't like them. Yeah, yeah. It, again, it's it's a tankless. It makes the water instantaneously, but it's tankless. It just doesn't yeah. store. It. Instantaneous down there, not up yeah. at the fixture. Yeah. Right. Right. Anytime, anytime someone tells me I'm a lawyer, I tell them that I appreciate their education, but I am highly educated as well. There you go. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, instantaneous is what the code is. What the code is you certify to, so it's stuck as to what it is. 
endless is what they try to promote, but the side rating plate says instantaneous code. Yeah, again, it's what you call it to them. It's what how what term what words do you use with your customer? And, and I love that. I don't know who said it earlier. It was brilliant. Uh, it was as an ex. Uh, the difference between an explanation and an excuse is when you tell it. <laughs> that applies here too, right? <laughs> I love yeah. that. Well, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, pretty good night, soon, Anthony. That's gonna yeah. be part of my everyday thing. I'm gonna steal that. I just want whoever put it down to know that I'm gonna steal it. But but if it helps you feel any better, you're not the only person I've stolen stuff from. <laughs> I'll, I'll dig at, out. You're it. looking at two others right up there. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Semi, I like the semi instantaneous with the tank. It gives me some storage and it's a modulating burner. Well, there you go. That works too. That works too. Oh, hey, we got a real question here from James House. Mr. JJ, how you doing? How you doing? Instant. Oh, oh no. Bu, 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 bu. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I, it wasn't you, JJ. It was Carlton Pember. I'm sorry. On the four way mixing valve, can it be used with chilled water and glycol? It can be used with glycol for a heating system. On a chilled water system, I'm, I don't know is it's going to do what we want it to do because it's outdoor reset and it's trying to reach certain temperatures. So I'm not too sure you're going to find a much of a use for that, the, our specific eye valve in a chilled water application. Probably could use it in a set point, but I don't know if it's going to go that low. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Off the top of my head, so. I'm not, I don't think the control is there. It's designed for heating, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't think it's gonna yeah. it's gonna be reading those kinds of low temperatures. Looking for an apples to apples performance GPM comparison. Uh, Peter, give me some give me some more on that. I'm not quite sure what your what uh, what the apple what 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 two apples are you what apples are you comparing to what apples? I guess uh, maybe I miss I'm, I'm I I feel like I've missed something in the missed something here. Maybe maybe you guys caught it. I, I, I he's I, if I, you look up, he's probably talking about. Um, tankless applications oh, okay. uh, compared to um, uh, tank style. Yeah. Oh, tankless versus ModCon with indirect. Sure. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. that would be, a, I mean, that that you'd have to look at the specs and, and then see how you pipe it up and how you set it up. But that would be, uh, again, I mean, 212 first hour, uh, you know, first hour, uh, first hour rating is 212 gallons. That's pretty cool. That's pretty good. Um, you know, at 3.1, you know, call that three gallons per minute of 140 degree water. What are you going to get with the tankless? Then you'd have to compare your specs at that point. And again, you're tempering down at the fixture. You may be tempering at the tank, but you're also tempering at the fixture down to whatever it might be for, you know, what's comfortable bathing water temperature, you know, 100, 102, 103, you know, uh, whatever that might be. Uh, so that's going to extend that three gallons per minute out even further. Normally, if you look at your temperature rise, that's, that's and what becomes what an exact science. I'm sorry, Rick, go ahead. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. If you look at your temperature rise and you look at your dump load, so how many gallons a minute do you need and you need it now? Normally, if you do that comparative, a tank style will always win over that uh, uh argument when it comes to the dollars it takes to hang two or three or four tankless style units on a wall, not to mention the venting, the gas piping, and everything else that has to suit those four units at 199,000 BTUs. So anyway, um, again, look at what your dump load is and uh, do the comparison on your own. Typically, uh, 119 gallon tank uh, does a whole lot especially when you do like what we talked about today and we store it high and we mix it back down we can give you a whole lot of water really fast and um, in order to get that same type of performance with units that have no storage it takes a whole lot of btus so you always mm -hmm. have that's part of the equation you got to look at your venting you got to look at your gas piping etc so uh again uh, so I remember when I first put together that indirect uh, presentation, um, you guys don't remember the old purchasing manager at Wurzbo. He predated both of you guys there. Uh, he was building a house. This was 1995, my first year there, and he was building a house. And as a purchasing manager, one of the things he got to do was to collect a lot of favors from people. So he got free stuff for when he was building his house. He was leveraging this like crazy. Um, he, he kind of corralled me because, you know, I'm kind of dumb and didn't think to close my office door. He corralled me into helping him design the, his heating system. 
And uh, as it turns out, he he was showing me, you know, the, he wanted me to want us to, to, to design a radiant heating system for him. And I was looking at the master bathroom, and he, there was this humongous two-person tub in the master bathroom. And Rick's was one of these guys who married way out of his league. I mean, I don't know what legal issues she had, but she married Rick, who was kind of like us. But she was like Giselle Bunch and gorgeous. I no, nobody could understand this whole thing, this whole arrangement. And I asked him, well, what, what's the tub for? And he looked at me and went, you know what the tub's for? You know what the tub's for? I said, oh, cool. All right. Well, well how, what, do, what, are we, what are we looking at for a water heater? And he goes, you're not going to believe it, but the gas company gave me for free a 40-gallon water heater. And I'm thinking, well, great. What are you going to do with it? Because you, if you use that, you're, gonna, you're not going to bother. Don't bother with the tub. And he didn't understand that, you know, this thing wasn't going to fill that thing. He had an issue of storage and an issue of recovery. And he just thought I wanted him to pay to buy something expensive. And then he started to make a deal with me. He says, look, well, what if I don't use the tub very often? Like he's going to make a deal with the water heater. Got you're going to, you know, 40 gallon water heater, you're going to cruise for 28 days a month. But 20 on that 29th day, man, I want you to give me all you got and then some. He didn't, he didn't know the math. It just wasn't going to work. Uh so from that was kind of where that that presentation we just did was born. So we gave him the opportunity to, you know, to, to use the tub. He just needed a, like Rick said, 119 gallon storage tank. He needed that, you need that dump, right? Here's a question from Mike Westgard. Sorry for all the green guy questions. A question on circulators. Do circs completely stop flow if they are not active? I ask because we have a, an HP home that is using hydronic heating, cooling, and dehumidification to the dehumidification unit. Do we need to install a zone valve? Um, boy, uh, let me. I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna send him an answer right now. Okay. And and just say that if you pipe it right and you put the uh, the check valve in there properly. Uh, you don't need to add a zone valve. It's kind of like uh, John's always referred to as belt and suspenders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and one right. one will do the job if it's done right. Okay, you don't always need two of them. So hopefully that answers your question. But it all comes down to how it's piped. Uh, that's when we start talking about circulators being hydraulically isolated from other circulators in the system, so we don't get ghost flow and migration and things like that. So. Anyway, hopefully that answers your question. Again, a picture is worth a thousand words, so uh, draw some up and we can comment on it accordingly. Yeah, it is going to depend upon that. So, but if it's if it's any Taco circulators in there, and if if it's within the last fifteen years, twenty years that we've, I think it was what two thousand six, I think it was two thousand and six that we've been making our double O sevens that can accept a check valve in there. So you may need to add a check valve if you're experiencing that ghost flow in a system or something like that. So uh, you could always take a circulator out, pop the check valve in and and keep going. So to prevent any of that ghost flow that you may be experiencing, if that's it. But like Rick said, it does depend upon your piping. So we'd have to take a look at that. All right, and Mike follows up with, so basically the circ will stop flow on a dehumidification branch. It's just going to stop. It, it, the circulator itself isn't going to stop flow. A check valve is going to prevent other circulators from flowing through a flowing through a branch where where we don't need it. So right, very good. When we All say right. when, I, when I say ghost flow, uh, what that also means is hot water rises, and you could actually have in a pipe in a vertical pipe two different flows happening at the same time. Circulators off, you'll have hot water going up and hot and cold water coming down. So it could also be how it's 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 piped into the system. You can do you know gravity loops in there so to prevent that migration from happening in one pipe. So you know, thermal traps, uh, yeah. Thermal trap. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. So you could see that happening. A check valve would stop that. So that's what uh, I mean by ghost flow uh, could be experiencing. But again, it may depend upon how the system is piped. Yeah. Very good. Very good. All right. So. I think you got you got a you got a ten dollar answer there, Mike. <laughs> that was a good one. All right, <laughs> excellent. So yeah, we got I have, uh, Jeff House is checking out. Have a good evening, Mr. House. Anthony Reichow checked out a little bit ago. Anthony, we love having you on these things. Yeah, uh, Ant was so, going for a cigar. So yeah, that's <laughs> you don't get in the way of Anthony and a cigar ever. <laughs> uh, Wheels, 
You're going to go to bed too, old boy. All right, good to have you there. We finally, we finally get, we finally gave you the 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 eye valve class. I hope this is what you were looking for. Mr. McGrath is checking out. Very good. Now it's a question from Buddy Felt. Am I the only one who has a constant problem with the IFC checks collecting micro bubbles when on a seldomly used zone? No, you're not. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Has nothing to do with the check valve. Yeah. Now, what does it have to do with, Rick? Yeah. Not purging the system, not using a good air separator, um, things like that. You know, there's nothing inherent to the IFC that collects air bubbles. I, I've i experienced that a lot here where I am on Long Island, and it's a lot of how the guys pipe out systems, too. But also remember this. Anytime you bring water into a boiler, when you start purging, that water's coming in has 10% air in it, up to 10% air. So you could be purging out all the big air bubbles, and there's still going to be little air bubbles still in that water itself. The only true way, to, the best way to get the air out is you got to let that boiler run for at least four hours and get it up to temperature. Get it up to temperature, that air is going to come out of solution, and you're going to be able to get it out. Um, so a lot of the times when we do that service work on a system itself and we put check valves in circulators and we find um, that that first circulator, it's, it's, it's a lot of times I see it here on the island where I am, we do this, the header coming off the boiler and then we put in a couple of zones of circulators coming off of that. And it's that first one that gets that air bound in there. I actually experimented with a couple of contractors here on the island that seem to experience it continuously. We took some check valves and we drilled really small holes into the check just to allow that air to come out of it because they weren't only, yeah, it's always the first one. That's right. I see you there, buddy. Yep, that's <laughs> what it is. It's that first one. So if you really want to get rid of it, what I've known a lot of guys do, they get rid of the check valves on the first one and we'll put in a flow check. So you've ah. got some volume of pipe to accept that air. And then when that zone kicks on, then it goes around back to the system and, and to the air eliminator going that way. Or go IF, uh, go with the uh, the ECM that has the, the air feature that we have built into it to get the air out of the circulator. So 007Es, 15Es, 18Es has that air elimination system uh, built in. All right, so it'll it'll speed up and slow down to blast air out of there if it finds itself being air bound. So that's a that's a that, that's a, a nice a, a nice built in solution that also gives you a more uh, more more efficient circulator. Rick's back. We lost you there for a second. Right. There, it doesn't it doesn't matter the air separator, buddy. It's 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 just because new water coming into a system is going to have up to ten percent air in there. So you'll purge purge purge, but you're still introducing more and more air in. So gotta always remember that too. So yes. And Terry Turner, how you doing, Terry? Terry's one of, Terry, when did you first come out to Minnesota? You, are you and the missus? This was, boy, God, that must have been, was that late 90s? I, I think it was late 90s. Oh, God, that's 20, over 20 years ago, Terry. How you doing? It's good to, good to have you here. Uh, depending upon water chemistry of the application, tankless water heaters may require more maintenance, i.e. heat exchanger cleaning, than a system with a boiler and an indirect. And users should be made aware of potential maintenance requirements of each system. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I mean, maintenance is I mean, well, maintenance is a way of life now, anyway, right? When you're talking about um, when you're talking about you know tankless water heaters, when you're talking about modulating condensing boilers, uh, maintenance is a lot different than when we were lads. You know, back when you had uh, when you had a cast iron boiler and you just had if it was an oil boiler, you had it cleaned every year. If it was a gas boiler, every few years. And that was you didn't treat the water, you didn't do anything else. Even if you forgot a year, you were probably okay, you know. <laughs> uh, now, not anymore, man. You got it's a maintenance on modern heating equipment is a way of life, and that's and it's another conversation you have to have with your customers well in advance so they know it. So it's an explanation as opposed to an excuse. God, I love that state. I love that saying. That saying. Jerry McPeak. Jerry McPeak said that, so you have to remember that. All righty, Gary. Thank you for that. You've 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 added to my repertoire. I really appreciate it. Does the seven does the 007E do exactly what does the 007E do exactly to free itself 
of an of an obstruction in the impeller. Dave, do you have your 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 uh, uh, display handy? We're not going to tell you, Antonio. We're going to show you. <laughs> Davy boy has this right at his fingertips, and we're just going to sit back and let it happen. Let, All dude, right. let the magic happen, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so here is our ECM circular. This is a 70. Um, I, I took the casing off of here, so this way, if I were to turn this on, it is powered. I do have power to it. Uh, On-off switch just thrown right on the front side of the circulator here. And if we turn this on, this is showing an airbound circulator. What it's going to do is since there's no resistance on the impeller when it starts turning, and it is going to quickly slow down and speed back up again, just like taking a ball valve. Any valve that you find that you have close to a circulator, if you know you've got an air bubble in the system, we sit there and try and jam it really quick. We try to change the pressure differential in the system to jar that air bubble out and send it back to the air bubble. So when I turn this circulator on, I'm powering it up, it's running. So, but what you'll see on the front side, you'll go from the blue light to a flashing white. And what that says is, hey, I don't feel a resistance on the impeller and it does a quick drop in speed. And I can feel this in my hands as it's running. I can feel that quick change in speed just to jar the air bubble out of the impeller or out of the volute and send it back into the system itself and hopefully the air uh, air eliminator gets it out of there it's not going to purge your system it's just trying to get the air out of the casing that may have trapped itself in here so it doesn't burn the circulator up if i were to leave the circulator right now running for the next say 30 minutes or so this light's eventually going to turn red because the motor got hot and shuts down and says all right i'm not going to keep running you need to come back here, purge, so this way I don't burn out. So we don't want to burn the circulator out. It's just, so if, if you find that red light, it just means it got a little hot. We're going to save ourselves so we don't burn out. All you have to do is reset the circulator, turn the power off, turn it back on, and you're done. So, but that's an automatic air purge. So, buddy, that may help you on a lot of times, too, is, now, what is about, working on those ECMs. Now, what about uh, the, the uh, Sure Start? Let's see the so sure the, start. Yeah, the second half of sure start is, hey, we're just entering the summer now. So we're going to have a lot of circulators sitting off all summer long, not turning. And the the the, um, the tolerances between an impeller and your casing, really tight. Cast iron circulators, a little bit of rust if we're not treating that water, could get this impeller to seize up and not turn. So... And you guys have experienced seized up circulators out there. And I know what you guys do out there. If you get the phone call in September that we're not getting heat, you walk down to the boiler room, you feel that circulator, it's screaming hot. The green paint starting to turn a little brown from overheating a little bit. What's the next thing you do? And I know what you do. And you may not want to tell me what you do. And I want you to do it, actually. <laughs> Do it. Yeah, I know you do. So we don't put it in the instructions, you know, but if you experience a circulator not spinning, has a call for heat, it's getting really hot. I want you to, whatever tool you have in your hand, give the circulator a couple of hacks, a couple of whacks. You just wrap it, you know, so you've got a flashlight, you've got an adjustable wrench, you got pliers, whatever you have, just don't your phone, don't use your phone. And you give that circulator just a couple of wax on the side of it. And what you're trying to do is free up that rust that was holding the impeller from turning it all. So this circulator has that part too. So I'm going to hold the impeller. I'm going to put two thumbs on here and, and check it back. Turn this thing on and it's not spinning. So what you're going to see here is the circulator is going to know it's not turning. And what it does, it stops. You see the red light here. And the white flesh, it actually shakes that impeller back and forth really fast and then goes back up to like about 5,000 RPM. Stops, shake, shake, shake. All right, it's trying to break free whatever's making that impeller hold its place. And if I'm quiet for a second, you might be able to hear it. There's the shake. Yep. 
Mm -hmm. right? And there's the high speed. Now, obviously, this is a lot louder because there's no water in the system. It's not going to amplify with the water in there. But and I also have this next to the microphone. So that's trying to to try to free it up and and eliminate the nuisance calls that we experience and kill circulators. If you walk downstairs and there's a heat call and the circulator is not hot. Now you have to replace it. It's dead. Right. All right. You burned yeah. out the motor. Yeah. So you always want to see a hot motor if it's not spinning and give it a couple of wax just to get it going. So you might be able to, Hey, all right, today I got the heat on may have to come back, change out that circulator or, Hey, we're good to go. So just so you know, that's that, you know, but this is going to eliminate a lot of those nuisance calls on projects. Very good. Very good. All right. How are we doing out there for questions, folks? Uh, Rick looked like you took care of one uh, for, for Paulie. If they don't about the IFC. Very good. Uh, excellent. Well done. Well done. And uh, Antonio, we showed you that's how it works. It'll just it'll just rock back and forth and try to break itself free. It'll do that up to 100 cycles over 20 pin, uh, 20 minute period of time. After 100 cycles, if it can't break free, it's got to figure something's really messed up here. Like there's a stick in there or something. So then what it'll do is it'll it'll shut down. It'll go into that you know the, the everything shuts down. The red the LED turns red and that's a sign for someone to come fix me. All right. What are you having tonight, Dan? Raspberry chip ice cream. Raspberry chip. I didn't know raspberries had chips. Oh boy, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, that sounds that's pretty the good. that's the ice cream shop out in Michigan City. So very good. Got to get there. Got to get see you, brother yes. man. All righty. Well, good. Uh, let's uh, make one last. Uh, uh, the the oh, the chips are chocolate. Okay, <laughs> the, ras the ice cream is raspberry. The chips are chocolate. So it's it's actually raspberry chocolate chip. Then technically, isn't it? I mean, wasn't that out of line? <laughs> we had. Uh, did I tell you about the avocado ice cream we had a while ago? Yes. Yeah. Um. It was. It was. It was good. It was an ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you if you reason that if you if you reason ahead of time that this is not going to taste like ice cream because it's not ice cream, mm -hmm. then you you your you, your expectations are lowered. You are pleasantly surprised. Yes, and then you're fine. I have found, and and it has been one of the great lessons of my life that the more I lower expectations for <laughs> others, the happier they'll be with me. All right. <laughs> the lower, more I lower expectations of others, the more happier I'll be with them. You know, I just, I just think if we all lowered our expectations about 20%, the world would be a great place, but that's just me. That's, 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 that, that's, that's the world according to Garp here, I guess. Uh, anyway, have you guys seen on, on, online the, uh, um, the uh, people are putting like uh, on Facebook, we're doing you know, the, like the 10 albums that influenced you most. I just finished that one or the 10 books that influenced you most. You know, I, I was going to do that, but three of them were comic books and it just wasn't going to work out very well. Um, <laughs> you know, or, or the 10 movies that influenced you most. Oh, that's kind of interesting, you know. So, uh, yeah, it was a, it was those are those are fun exercises to, exercises to see, you know. So what Dave, what book influenced you the most in your life? any books oh man not 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 a lot of books really influence i i mean i use them for entertainment value but uh oh i gotta think back to um they, they, they i got a couple in the oh, you know what oh i just found it this one just at h2o man, this man, one Holl did. Hollahan's yeah. great unloved unloved masterpiece. That's my yeah. favorite book. Yeah, yeah. This is one of my favorite books that I had read. Um, he just reintroduced it, so mm -hmm. they just re-released it. It was out of uh, out of print for a while, um, and this really changed how I can really think about um, hydronics and how to talk about it. So I felt that was a a, a big change on how I was uh, doing my job, so to speak, because I was mostly tech support and design in the beginning days and and then once i read that it it really changed how i can do training classes and and made me uh be able to talk about it 
a lot more confidently too. So that was, that was a good book about it. So, and I just, um, Erin, uh, just recently sent this to me because I had talked to her about, uh, getting my hands on one and she says, Oh, we, it's out of print. So when she put it back into print, I, I actually reviewed a PDF version of it for her and she was kind of afraid it was going to be outdated. And, uh, you know, a lot of things didn't apply anywhere because she, that Dan was talking about, um, fax machines and telex right. machines and things like that and i said it still applies we still know what they are we can still talk about it and read about it so um it did it did change a lot of things for me and i think i think a lot of people here should definitely read this yeah pumping away great book primary secondary piping you know another good book to read so but this one i think really helps us explain and talk to it with our homeowners and in, in what we do on a regular basis yeah rick how about you uh does it have to be industry related or no it's just a book that's what i thought paper you know, with words uh, happy hooker <laughs> um so let's get to the questions eh okay how will air in the system react the ecm circulator books i have seen with other water cooled circulators them seize up uh, I think, uh, David, uh, is it Hinegar? I, I believe so. Uh, the air in the system, the circulator is going to, you know, first off, let's let's go back to the basics. You have to purge the system. Purging the system does not mean filling the system with water. Okay, you actually have to do a purging method and get all the big bubbles out, and then a good air separator will take care of the micro bubbles. But the circulator is going to deal with air just as Dave just described. Our uh, ECMs will actually look at the air in the system and change their speed and try to just get that air up out of the volute. Again, it doesn't get rid of the air in the system. Uh, that's up to you as a professional, but uh, we'll uh, uh, kind of do a self-preservation. So uh, we, we, we're reasonably sure our circulators will never have a problem with seizing up because of air. You can't run them dry, but they do have a mechanism that uh, gets rid of uh, air that's bound in the volute or the casing itself. So hopefully that makes sense. Well, well, well this one here has been run dry for about five years already. So oh, it's yeah. still going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. There you go. <laughs> Very good. Uh, can I do my book now? Sure. Yeah, sure. Definitely. Yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird. Atticus Finch is, uh, is just a. One of the one of the greats. I mean, the, uh, Harper Lee came out with that uh, that that sequel not too long ago, um, a few years ago, and it showed him in a different light. But but you know, it's just uh, it was it was interesting reading that book and then having my kids read the book when they were in school and then talking about it with them. You know, whether you're talking about racism and talking about uh, you know one of the great lines from Atticus Finch was you know never never judge a person unless you've walked a mile in their shoes. Um, it's just one of those things you always think about, and uh, it's it's it, as far as influential goes, you know. Um, I never read The Happy Hooker, but it, if I had, maybe that might have been been a little bit more higher on my list. Uh, Rick, <laughs> you asked, I'm, and I'm not going to again. No. Okay. <laughs> oh, let's see. I got a whole bunch of books over here, though. That's I still. Have. Oh, here's something cool. Let me show you guys something. Uh oh, let's see here. These came from my uncle Mike, who was my godfather, uh, and was a great plumber. He worked with my dad for a long, worked for my dad for a long, long time. But he had these, and he gave them to me. And it's the the Starbuck books. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this. Questions and answers on the practice and theory of sanitary plumbing. This is volume two, written by Robert M. Starbuck. Volume three. Uh, this was, you know, hot, uh, hot, uh, hot water supply and circulation, All right? This one is uh, practical problems. Uh, volume four, drainage inventing, and then volume one is also drainage inventing. So these are these were the textbooks back back in the day. I don't know how I'm just gonna go back. What and date? See when published. Uh, this is original. The original publication was 1900. Uh, so it was first published in 1900. The, the, the edition I have was 1945. 
All right, so it's again, it's got the, you know, you start with your basic definitions. You know, what is a trap? We have, you know, diagrams and things for basic plumbing. I mean, this is this these are the, these were the how-to books back back in the old days. So so these are, I mean, these are priceless. I I don't know what to do with them, um, but I can't seem to get, you know, they're from my godfather, so I can't seem to give them up, you know. Um, so that's, uh, I mean. They belong in a museum someplace. Maybe the, maybe maybe that the 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 Society of Mechanics down in in New York. That might be the right place for these things. I think if they don't already have a set. So I'll check with Dan Hollihan and see if they have them, because these should these should be somewhere where people can appreciate them. Um, you know, so that's uh that's that those were very influential. And I've got one other one too. Hold on, don't go away. <laughs> Here he comes. This goes back to the 40s as well. This is the original B and G uh, hydronics design handbook. Now nice. you get into your your the, the the real basics of of hydronic heating systems and design. And in this book, they start they talk a little bit about pumping away. And in this book, actually going back to the 1942 version, which I also have kicking around here, they talk about outdoor reset. Mm. They call it outdoor weather compensation, and it was done with, you know, uh, capillary tubes. Uh, capillary. Uh, yeah, capillary, thank you. No, capillary. I'm just <laughs> tomato, tomato. I'm just <laughs> tomato, <laughs> tomato. Yeah. Yeah. You go, go, go read a book, all right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? No, 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 God, no. <laughs> but... Um, you know, they, but it goes it goes back that far. People, oh, this is a new. Nothing's new, man. It's just re, it's reimagined, it's repackaged, it's reengineered. You know, I mean, people knew way back when that that you know, hey, if we we change the water temperature based on how cold it is outside, the system will work better and it'll be more efficient. Oh no, right? Yeah. You know. Uh, that whole pumping away thing. Homer Thrush came up with the centrifugal pump, and then about a week after he came up with it, somebody figured out we better put it on that side of the expansion tank and not this side. You know, I mean, this is this. None of this is new. It's it's just old. It's 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 stuff we've known forever, and it's stuff that we'll keep learning. And right. um, you know, it's 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 not like everybody knows this, so we have to stop teaching it. It's you're teaching a parade. New folks come along and need to know. You know. And, and, uh, uh, and I find one thing with hydronics, you have to try hard. I mean, work hard at it in the morning with a plan to say, I'm going to mess that job up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be so forgiving. It's going to be forgiving. I mean, you're, you're going to wake up and say, you know, I'm going to mess that up tomorrow on purpose. So yeah. it is forgiving when we don't do it right. But when we do it right, it can be so much better. That's yeah. the, that's the thing about it too, is, is how it can feel and how, I mean, I've lived in bad hydronics. I've lived in hot air systems and I've lived with good hydronics. And, uh, and I remember, and I don't know if he's still here, buddy of mine here, uh, Leroy, uh, Leroy Squires. He works with uh, NHH now down in, uh, in the Baltimore area. And we were sitting at the bar one night. Um, I think I was about four Manhattans in. And uh, he's, he, we're sitting there and he says, I've been to so many training classes with you, Dave. How do you keep doing it like this over the last 10 years? And I mean, yeah, I'm a few drinks in and I said, you know what? All I want is, is, is people to be as happy in their home as I am in mine, you know, with their heating <laughs> system. And he's like, whoa, that's deep. And I'm like, yeah, that's a lot of drinks. So, <laughs> um. You know, you can make it great and you can make it just not suck too. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And it doesn't take a whole lot to go from not suck to great, you know? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it, it, you know, there's things, you, and, it, and as professionals, you know, an amateur, a handyman can, can keep people from freezing to death. That's easy. That's not a, not a difficult trick to pull off. And, an, and a handyman could probably do it for a hell of a lot less money than anybody here could. Why are professionals professionals? Professionals are professionals because they know how to do it right. They know how to maximize and optimize and 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 comfortize and all that other good stuff. It's a it's a lot different from keeping people from freezing to death, and and that's what I I believe everyone should aspire to. All right. Well, hey, we're down to about 39 people, so it might be time to say good night to everybody. Um, 
we got to watch Seinfeld's 23 hours. Hmm. No, from suck to great. You got to watch Seinfeld's 23 hours. Okay, great. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, hey, guys, thanks for everything. Appreciate the time. Dave, Rick, as always, fantastic job. Uh, Johnny, I know I'm Johnny's may, may be gone by now, but uh, thanks for the thanks for the interlude. That was just that was powerful and and and, and much appreciated. And uh, we look forward to seeing Ben and, uh, and J3 next week. Yes. That'll be good. Yeah, we'll get it there. Yep. All righty, folks. We're going to say good night. Thank you all for joining us for part nine. See you next week for part 10. So long. Enjoy.